Hey everyone, this is uh, Ahmed Farag. I'm one of the co-chairs for the uh, RFS Communications Committee. We uh, run all the webinars. Today we have a really awesome uh, IRDR resident match panel with some uh, soon to be residents here in like two weeks. So listen intently, they got a lot of good information. Uh, Varun Danda, we're gonna let you start. This is your show. Awesome, thank you so much Ahmed for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Varun Danda, and I am the current chair of education within the SIR Medical Student Council. Um, it is my great, great pleasure to moderate this highly anticipated webinar, um, the annual IRDR resident match panel for the 2020 academic year. Um, we are joined today by some very exceptional applicants to the IRDR process this past year, and we're hoping that they can volunteer some time with us to help share some of the advice and pearls that they've gathered throughout the application season, but also throughout the other years of medical school. Um, so yeah, again, thank you to our panelists for making it today. So um, if you tuned into the PD panel last week, we're gonna use a similar Q&A system as that. So if you want to ask any questions, go to slido.com and either use the code SIR match panel, or you can use the QR code to automatically get there and then you can ask questions through that website and also upvote other popular questions that you think you would want to get answered as well and then at the end or throughout the panel we're going to try and answer them as we go on okay okay um without any further ado why don't we get into the webinar outline so first we're going to have the panelists introductions um then we're going to move on to questions so first of all choosing ir and the rest of it will be split up into two components, the first being the path to become a competitive applicant. So this would mostly focus on the MS1 to MS3 years. Um, then we're going to have second half be about the application process, mostly the fourth year of medical school. And then finally, a Q&A from the audience based on slido.com. Okay, so again, it is my great privilege to introduce our all-star panel of recently matched IR residents. Um, again, we thank you for taking the time out of your day to um, participate in this panel and share some of the advice that you've gleaned from this process. Um, so if the panelists will be so kind to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about themselves, um, the medical school in which you went to, uh, and then where you matched, and then anything else you would like to share. So um, Hanson, would you mind starting us off? Yeah, thanks for, for uh, inviting us to speak on this panel. We hope it's really informative for uh, the upcoming IRs. Um, so my name's Hanson Lee. I'm a graduate of the Medical College of Georgia, and I'm about to start my transitional year at Wellstar Kennestone, which is in Atlanta, and I'm heading subsequently to Emory University for my integrated IRDR training. Awesome. All right, so I guess I'm next in line. Uh, I'm Lisa Liu. I went to Rush University for medical school, and I matched at Col University of Colorado IR, which is in Denver. Um, and I'm actually starting tomorrow uh, at Sinai West in New York for my prelim surgery year. So, got the ID and everything today. <laughs> awesome, nice. awesome. Uh, moving I'm on Varun. to Varun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm Varun Singh. I went to. Uh, Thomas Jefferson from medical school. I'm an integrated resident at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, I start my surgical internship at the MGH on Saturday. Awesome. Uh, moving on to Neil. Hey guys, my name is Neil. I went to Rowan University, SOM, and I match integrated at Georgetown starting tomorrow as well. Georgetown has a categorical program, which is nice that you get two months of IR uh throughout your diagnostic and surgical years so something i'm looking forward to this year and uh i'm adam swirsky um i just graduated from the university of miami miller school of medicine and um, an integrated ir resident at northwestern in chicago um, i'm also doing a surgery year i'm um, doing it at northwestern it's not a categorical program per se um, but i kind of chose to do it that way um, I will get a month of IR this year, like uh, Neil as well. So I start in two weeks, so I'm, I'm not uh, as close as some of these guys here. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, yeah, thank you again for coming. As some of you, as you just said, some of you are already starting your intern year, so I can imagine this is a super busy time. So again, thank you for joining us. And why don't we get started? 
Also, I apologize if my webcam is a little dark. I This room doesn't have the best lighting, so apologize for that. Um, okay, so moving on to our, our first question. Um, and for this one, we're going to have everyone answer. But for the following questions, um, we're only going to have about three panelists respond for a question just for time constraints. But since this is an important topic, we're going to have everyone um, give their thoughts on this. So choosing IR, how did you first learn about IR? What were the driving factors that solidified your interest in the field? And given the current pandemic, how should students figure out if IR is for them? So starting off with Hanson, if you have any thoughts about those questions. Yeah, so I first learned about IR through my school's activities fair, where our IRIG leader uh, showcased some cool catheters and talked about some, some of these cool procedures. So um, after reaching out to um, Shadow and IR at my institution, I got to see a TIPS procedure probably the first couple months into med school. And obviously I was blown away. I was intrigued by the procedural aspects, the creative technology, the patient care aspect, as well as uh, most importantly, the amazing and supportive culture of the radiology department. So um, I guess given the pandemic um, opportunities to shadow IR may be limited, but definitely try to reach out if uh, the opportunity arises or try to do a virtual rotation. Um, additionally, you can always go to rfs.sirweb.org and look at our introduction to IR tab where you can read about the history of IR, common IR procedures, and watch some common procedures on our YouTube page. Awesome. Thank you, Hanson. Um, Lisa, do you have any thoughts to these questions? Yeah, so in terms of choosing IR, um, I feel pretty fortunate in that I learned about IR and decided on it pretty early on, so I had some time to explore that. Well, I know that's not everyone's route, but basically after college, I was still finalizing my decision whether or not I actually wanted to be a doctor or not, so I decided to do two gap years as a clinical research assistant at vascular surgery at Mount Sinai. Um, and I thought the endovascular procedures that the vascular surgeons were doing were really cool. I'd never really seen anything like that before. Um, I heard the words interventional radiology, didn't really know much about it, but I heard that the procedures were kind of similar in nature. So I reached out to the IR department there, totally cold reach out. Um, and I think that speaks a lot to just the community, like Hansen mentioned. Um, like I wouldn't have gone into IR if the community wasn't just so supportive and encouraging. Um, I happened to reach out to Dr. Fishman, didn't even know at that time that was the person to reach out to at Sinai. Um, literally talked to him today, like we still keep in touch. He's still a mentor of mine. So um, that really, like the eye community is small, but widespread. So um, I mean, conferences, I'm so sad that SIR wasn't able to happen this year because the conferences are always just a huge blast. You get to reunite with all these great friends from across the country. Like I was looking forward to seeing all these guys there. <laughs> um, uh, other than that, reasons why I continue to pursue IR and loved IR, um, every case is different, even like a bread and butter, quote unquote, drain case. Um, I've seen some like drain cases that surprise the attendings with this crazy challenge that like no one saw coming and then you just have to figure it out in some creative way. Um, so it's all problem solving. And then I love that the whole premise of IR is pushing the boundaries of minimizing risk while maximizing outcomes. And um, also it's really focused on what the patient experience is. So basically it's, it's the future of medicine. Um, uh, sorry, I, I think I'm gonna take a little longer to just talk about women in IR specific just because I am the only woman on this panel. Um, so um, I'm gonna kind of address things that some people might say why women wouldn't want to go into IR and why um, I think that that's baloney. Um, first off, I know every it's always on the um, people's minds that radiation is a concern. Um, there's actually been a lot of studies out there that you can look up on PubMed that have been done to address these concerns and how to safely practice um, as, an, as a woman in IR. Um, just in general, or um, specifically during pregnancy. Uh, the Women and I Are group has come out with um, like a pregnancy toolkit so that um, it, if you do reach that milestone in your life, then you 
you have a um, you have like a community, you have people to go to to ask those questions um, very specific to your circumstances. Like we're all in this together. And um, there has been a lot of research shown that um, that the risk really is um, ne negligible with the right precautions. Um, given all of that, I've also heard from women and I speaking their experiences on other panels that if you are still personally concerned about radiation during pregnancy, you can make that choice to minimize your radiation time during that time and people will be supportive of you. So it's just kind of like you deciding what you want to do and people uh, should and will be supportive of your choice either way. Um, lifestyle wise, um, some of you may have, may have heard my opinions on this from my talk during the SIRPD boot camp this past weekend, but I personally feel like when people bring up lifestyle as a reason why women shouldn't go into IR, um, I say, you know what, lifestyle should be a question all people should be asking of themselves, not exclusively or especially women. And I simplified it a little bit during my talk this weekend uh, because of the time constraints there, but I want to expand on that a little bit more here. So um, basically, if you're a person of any gender and you're looking for this super intense, career-focused cowboy life, then awesome. You can find that in IR. That's something that draws me to IR. But also, if you're a person of any gender, again, looking for a life with more balance between work and out-of-work life, then Great, you can also find that in IR. There are there's a huge variety of lifestyle options that IRs can have, so you can find the right fit for you. And then lastly, I'm just going to talk a little bit about boys' clubs concerns. Um, basically, I'm just going to say, look, women can be bros too. <laughs> and in all seriousness, not every woman in IR is going to have that same personality uh, because we're all women and we're all different because people are all different. So, like, I know some. IRs who are girly girls. I know some women in IR who are broier than the biggest frat bro ever. Um, <laughs> some of my best friends in IR are women, and some of my best friends in IR are men. You know, it's just it's just all overall a really cool community. Um, I'm not going to say you know everyone everywhere is perfect um, by far. Like um, we're all human, but I think the most important thing is that there's also this really strong culture of just striving to do better in IR, um, you know, medically, clinically, but also uh, when we talk about topics of diversity and inclusion. So that drive is there and that activism is there. And I really appreciate that value of the community. Um, and with that, I think I'm just going to, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, Lisa. That was really, that was really well said. And I, I can echo you. Yeah, I, I can echo your sentiments that IR is thrives for excellence in almost everything. And I can see that even in the diversity avenue as well. And they take that very seriously. And yeah, I really appreciate you addressing some of the current concerns that some people might have. Awesome. Um, okay, so moving on to Varun, if you can address some of these questions. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I'm thrilled that Lisa took the beginning of the talk to just say that outright. And that that's, that's really wonderful. Um, so I first learned about IR, I think, on the first day of medical school, uh, because our very first lecture at Jefferson was an interventional radiologist who taught us about interventional oncology. And I think that piqued my interest very early. Um, and shadowing definitely really made a difference, that practical experience of being in an angiography suite, of looking at uh, fluoroscopy, of, of seeing the tools of the trade. But I think that the major driving factors that solidified my interest would be the community for sure. Um, attending the SIR annual meeting in multiple years of medical school really taught me that this was a like-minded community of interventionalists that are very team focused and also are very cerebral and cognitive in the way they approach complex medical problems, um, but also very team oriented. So I think that was a big deal. Um, other driving factors that solidified my interest in the field would be um, just the mentorship that exists, student-to-student -student mentorship, as well as um, the guidance of, of great mentors like Dr. Vatican Cherry, who I had the pleasure of rotating with. Um, so given the current state of clinical rotations that are elective, as well as visiting student rotations, I think that the way that students can figure out whether IR is right for them is first to kind of assess their personality interests based on their core clerkships. Like if they 
really love surgical kind of fields and they enjoy their virtual diagnostic radiology curricula and they're more technically minded uh, with pathology and disease states and they also have a natural affinity and um, passion for hepatobiliary disease um, women's health oncology PAD then I think that'd be one way of assessing whether um, IR is a good fit for them another way would be uh, to perform in a, way ro a home a rotation with interventional radiology and then determining um, specific IR programs based on the fit of a virtual interview process, which I'm sure we'll talk about later as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you for your thoughts. Um, moving on to Neil. So for my school, we actually didn't have an IR program and um, we had to seek out um, any type of IR experience. Fortunately for me, we were right outside of Philadelphia and we had an alumni who worked at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Dr. Seth Batsky, who served as my mentor. And I got paired up with them, just trying to figure out what radiology was. But as soon as I got into the suite, um, after just seeing all of like the catheters and wires, different instruments that were being used, uh, it was kind of like, giving me, it's, to me, it was like playing video games all over again. Um, obviously, it's much more than that. But what I loved about IR was that dynamic um, situation that you're always placed in, that it's not just, not each patient is the same, not um, each day is the same, right? You go in from doing um, filter placements, for patients that have pulmonary embolus to ending your week uh, of taking them out, you go doing aortic work, peripheral arterial disease, venous stroke, you name it, we're doing it. And I guess I can't say we yet, but IR is doing it. So that's what I really loved about it. Um, for me, when I entered medicine, I knew I didn't want to just care for my patients. I know that was something that I did want to do, but I also wanted to be a little bit more on the research side of medicine. I wanted to be on the innovative side of medicine. I love advocacy, both on the patient side, but also on uh, advocating for my profession. And the thing about IR is, it's as cheesy as this sounds, it's it's all encompassing. If you, since there's just so much, um, I know I use the word again, dynamic, but there's just, there's it's just, all encompassing on that end that you can have a private practice if you wanted to, or you can work academic. You, if you wanted to do research, there's always different tools that are being invented by your colleagues and um, from different uh, vendors or uh, industries. Um, if you want to do neuro IR, if you want to do oncology, uh, you can do whatever you want. And that's what I really love about IR. Um, and that's, in a way, what solidified my interest, that I can do all these little things that make me happy. Um, for now, for the current pandemic, what I would suggest students to do would be use Twitter. <laughs> um, use the SIR platform to kind of get your name out there. Get your, um, get learn more about IR if you're not sure if like if this is a field for you. I think social media is a great way uh, to just kind of get like a little inkling of all the different cases that are going on, what IR does. Um, I would also suggest um, contacting, uh, go on the SIR or RFS uh, website and contact a lot of the mentors. SIR does a phenomenal job of having a resource out there for you. Um, and you can just ask questions. I know Varun talked about Dr. Vatican Cherry, and he's phenomenal. I've actually, every time someone reaches out to me, I also <laughs> tell them to reach out to Dr. V. He's one of the first people uh, I've contacted reaching out uh, or learning about IR, and he'll spend a good 30 minutes uh, with you, and I'm sure he'll have <laughs> numerous phone calls by the end of the weekend. Um, <laughs> but do that. Another shameless plug is contact uh go to your local symposiums and the new jersey interventional radiology uh, symposium will be virtual this year so for all of you m1s m3s 
um, we're putting that together, um, or we're looking to uh, put it together now. Um, hopefully by December, there'll be an online uh, symposium for you guys. So definitely participate on that. Awesome, thank you, Neil. Um, your, your passion really shows when you talk about IR, so that's really great to hear. And also thank you for like that unique perspective of someone who didn't necessarily have an IR program at their department and like how you navigate around that. I think that's super important to some audience members. So thank you. And then um, last but not least, we have Adam. Do you have any thoughts on these questions of choosing IR? Yeah, um, so I love all those answers because it's like, you know, everything, everything boils down to the fact to me that IR um, everybody was talking about how there's like variety, you know, there's variety in pathophysiology, there's variety in career options. Um, and I think, you know, I'm the kind of person that never likes to be bored. And I think IR is the perfect uh, field for someone like that. Um, so when I was in high school, actually, I was deciding whether or not I wanted to even do pre-med in college. And so I was shadowing um, a gastroenterologist, um, had seen a bunch of colonoscopies and really wasn't sure like what medicine was all about outside of that and a few other you know experiences I had in the past and he kind of just sent me off to um, his buddy who is an IR for the afternoon and um, I didn't know the first thing about it I liked physics um, growing up um, that's my nerdy side um, which definitely fit in there but um, basically I he, the attending was telling me about how you could do a procedure um, with image guidance and the patient uh, has a the same or a better outcome as a surgery um, without the side effects of that surgery itself. Um, they stay in the hospital uh, for a shorter time. The cost is reduced. Um, and at the same time, you are um, an operator getting to do that procedure in a really cool way. Um, so I was kind of hooked from there, but you know, I still had to go through college and all that. I didn't really think about it that much, but once I finished my anatomy um, course, um, MS one year, I went to shadow and I didn't really have to make a decision from there. Um, but you know, what was great about my experience in medical school is that, you know, all the shadowing that I did, I attended several symposia. I met all these, um, amazing people on this panel, um, met the, our, you know, I wouldn't say our peers, but our, uh, the people ahead of us, um, you know, the MS fours when I was an MS two, all these mentors along the way, um, you know, all the people I've met in IR, you know, 10 out of 10, a hundred out of a hundred. I felt were the best people that I met in all of medicine, or at least the most like-minded, um, as Varun was saying earlier. Um, they were just, they felt like my people. And I felt comfortable around them. I felt happy about the, around them. I felt challenged around them. Um, and, uh, you know, but just to harp on it one more time, I think like, you know, what's so cool about IR is like, you know, you could, if you're in a, uh, if you're in a given NGO uh, suite, NGO department, and there's five rooms, you know, you might have, you know, somebody working on a prostate, you might have somebody preventing postpartum hemorrhage, somebody blasting away liver cancer, somebody treating a stroke, and then somebody else is like trying to figure out how to reconstruct somebody's, you know, messed up biliary system after a transplant or something. And in all of those scenarios, the patient is getting, you know, a redefined standard of care, basically, from what was once possible, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and, and way beyond that. And I think that the coolest thing about IR is that like it defines the field to be thinking of new ways to do things and, and to innovate. Whereas I think, you know, in other specialties, it's kind of like you're, you're trained in one way and you're taught to think one way and um, you look at everything that way. In IR, we're, you know, in the clinical, you know, model of training where we're all going into surgery years for the uh, most part, uh, transitional medicine, just whatever, you learn your clinical um, intern year, you then get to take a really deep dive into diagnostic radiology for three plus years and you learn um, anatomy in great detail, you learn pathophysiology in great detail, and then you get to go back to IR and you can apply it and you can actually start to help people and um, you're really raising the bar for for procedural care in medicine every time you step into the angio suite. So um, that's super motivating to me. Um, and then given the current pandemic, um, so I think it's really tough. I think this question depends a lot on what uh, year you are in medical school. You know, if you're a fourth year um, applying and you're listening to this, you already probably know that IR is right for you. So I think we're gonna get to um, some questions later related to the pandemic 
Um, but if you're younger and you're trying to figure out, you know, if it's right for you. Um, like I said, I think I had one or two shadowing experiences that I got in there and that kind of hooked me. And I didn't really do necessarily do that much shadowing on top of that per se, but like the ratio of me watching YouTube videos, scrolling through Twitter cases, um, attending these symposia, attending conferences, I spend more time doing that stuff than shadowing. Um, so if you can get in the Angio suite, um, even scrub in as a bonus, like that, that is great. And if you don't feel like you like it right away, um, give it another shot. And I would say, if you still don't like it, maybe it's not for you, but there are so many other ways to learn about IR. Um, and, you know, yeah, I think just take advantage of every single opportunity to consume information um, that you have. And th that would be my advice for now. Awesome, Adam. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think the diversity and the innovation aspects that you touched upon are something that's common to a lot of people that are interested in the field. Um, awesome. I see that a lot of there's a lot of great questions on Slatter.com. I just took a look. Um, I think we're going to wait till uh, maybe midpoint during the panel to answer them just to make sure we're on track. But um, don't feel like we're forgetting about those. So thank you. Um, OK, so our next topic is about the preclinical years and step one. So the questions are, what are the things that a preclinical student should focus on if they want to pursue IR? And then the caveat to that is also, and some of you, all of you haven't been in this position of students that would be in the pre-step pass, pre-step one pass fail era and people in the post-step one pass fail era. So if you could give, it's, I know you guys weren't in, in that situation, but if you have any advice, if you can extrapolate, um, that'd be awesome. And then the second question is, what advice would you give to a student who was disappointed in their step one score? And I think on the right, there's some kind of mean data from 2018 from the charting outcomes based on the people that matched into IR and the people who went unmatched. So we're going to start with Adam. All right. Um, so what are the things that a preclinical student should focus on? Um, well, I guess, yeah, we'll talk about, you know, the people that need step one. You got to um, at least do your best, your very best to um, you know, rock step one if you can, because obviously um, that helps put you in the driver's seat. And I'll get to, if you don't, um, I'll get to that with the next question, I guess. Um, and if you're not getting a step one score, um, obviously you need to pass that. And I think, you know, it'll be important, and I'm sure you guys are hearing this from lots of other um, people in the medical education community, but it's just as important, if not more important, for, your, for everybody to learn all that material still. Um, obviously, the reason that it went to a pass fail system. Um, is largely based on the fact that people didn't feel that the you know questions answers were related necessarily to a, a successful residency applicant or a clinical physician. Um, but there's a lot you know there's a lot to be learned um, in the first two years of medical school. So you know making sure you take your studies seriously is the most important thing, and not getting bogged down by other things if if that stuff is um, being affected. Um, but you know the important part of this question, I think because that, that applies to every medical student. This question says, if they want to pursue IR, um, if you know you want to pursue IR and you're in your MS1 and MS2 years, um, you should get involved because, um, you know, with SIR, with research, with something at least to get started, I think that um, regardless of any scoring, you know, grades, letters, whatever, when you sit down with a program director or a resident or any attending that's interviewing you or reviewing your application, um, if it were me on that end of the interview, I think passion for IR um, is the thing that would stand out most and is very specific to our specialty. Um, I think that, you know, I, I haven't experienced it, but I think it, it, it'd be hard to stand out in a pool of internal medicine applicants um, necessarily for being, you know, passionate about internal medicine. But interventional radiologists really want to know that you understand what their specialty is about. Um, what the day-to-day -day is like, so having done a rotation at the very least by that point. Um, but, you know, start building that passion out. Um, find out where your niche is in IR. That can be on several, you know, it can be SIR, it can be research. Um, there, you can invent a new way, you know, like, you know, someone started a podcast. And whatever it is, um, you know, I think if you're, if you know you're interested in IR, you're, um, grades and everything squared away, do your best, um, but start to, you know, build your resume 
um, as early as you can once you know. Um, and if somebody was disappointed in their step one score, I think, you know, the first advice obviously is to, um, you know, study hard and, and do as well as you possibly can on step two. Um, I think that program directors do consider, you know, the differences in those scores, at least they're like, you know, they look for um, an improvement. Um, but ultimately, again, I think it comes down to um, you overall as an applicant and um, all the more motivation, I think, to get involved. Um, you know, I don't think somebody's going to care about a mediocre step one score if they see, you know, this incredible human being um, with passion for IR jumping off the page and they have a great letter of recommendation from people they trust, people they know. Um, I, don't, I don't think that a step one score would preclude somebody from matching in, in that case. Um, so the rest of it really is in your hands to just kind of be the best um, you can in all other areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that That's advice, right. Adam. So Neil, yeah, you're the next to speak. Do you have any thoughts on these questions? Yeah, I think Adam did a phenomenal job and um, I don't have much more to add. I think in the preclinical years, definitely focus on step. Involve yourself for post-step, uh, for post-step one, um, now being past fail, involve yourself in SIR and RFS. And I know they'll talk about extracurriculars, but honestly, this this specialty is driven by passion. If you have the passion, you'll make it. Um, if you have that willingness to learn uh, and make uh, build these relationships, you'll make it. And I know I get this question a lot too, as I'm the only DO on this panel as well. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, Again, if you have the passion, you'll be here. Um, if you're disappointed with your step one score, uh, step two is not pass fail. So do better on step two. Um, show um, show that you know that you're making that jump, um, that you know you're working hard. Uh, study for it, take it early so it's uh, being shown to um, th the program directors, um, and then. Yeah, involve yourself. I know we're going to talk about extracurriculars next, so that's all I've had. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Um, moving on to Lisa, do you have any thoughts? Um, definitely seconding, thirding everything that Adam and Neil are saying. Um, I can speak personally to someone who was disappointed with my step one score, so I can talk about that. Um, so, I mean, I've always I, I want I want to just like preface this with I personally don't believe that a um, a single test score necessarily has um, has value in saying like what quality of a doctor and a person you are. Um, you know, I saw that set score. I was disappointed, um, not in you know myself as a person, but because I knew that this would make things more stressful for me later on. Um, and um, so, also full transparency here. I think even though I feel self-conscious talking about numbers, this isn't about me. This is what's going to best help you guys. So um, I got 227 on my step one. Um, knowing the statistics for IR, uh, this did give me some concern um, because I knew it wouldn't necessarily sink my chances, but I also knew that meant that I had something to prove on step two. Um, in regards to, you know, like, of course, you know, like, Someone can be an amazing, compassionate, intelligent, creative doctor and get a 227 or lower on their step one score. But I also know that people do worry about test scores and radiology fields because the radiology board exams does have a reputation for being a very, very hard test compared to other specialties. And you know what? That's a legitimate concern. You know, like um, you can't be an amazing doctor if you can't be a if you can't be a doctor, so if you can't practice. So, um, you know, there are hurdles that we have to jump. So um, just kind of making that clear why it is important uh, and why people might ask you about your stuff score as they did me on the interview trail. Um, so kind of prepare for it from that perspective when you're, if you do have a step one score you're disappointed about and you're on the interview trail and you have to answer that question, tailor it to why does this not translate into me doing poorly on the board exams. And for me, um, I uh, basically for step two, I just knew I had to step it up. So I very honestly assessed my study techniques and tactics, and I used the M3 year, um, like the shelf um, exams, to practice and experiment with 
what different tactics I could use to do better. Um, and I knew I worked really hard studying for step one. It wasn't like I was trying to be lazy or anything, but I wasn't studying smart. Um, and what I found made a big difference for me for step two was flashcards, which I'm sure like you know, some you guys are like, oh, come on, that's basic. But um, for me, I always wanted to be that person who like, oh, I can understand everything and I can reason my way through every single question on this exam to get to the answer, as long as I understand the critical thinking of it. And yeah, obviously critical thinking is important, but for these types of exams, it's just not realistic time-wise to work through every single question. And also you just can't reason your way into some things like whether genetic disorder is all of a sudden dominant or res recessive, you just need to memorize that. So um, you just gotta memorize, the best way to memorize is space wrap. Um, <clears throat> even if you're not a flashcard person, just do it. And uh, that might be different for other people, but that's what worked for me. Um, and uh, I got a 264 on step two, and that definitely made me feel a lot more confident going into the interview process to be able to say that when people ask me about my step one score. So that's my specific advice if you really do want to improve on step two. Thank you, Lisa. I think that's a, a really important perspective for people to hear and just goes to show that numbers really aren't everything in this process, and you can definitely make up for any Defic perceived deficiencies in so many other ways, whether it be passion, step two, or so many oh, what's other ways that we'll actually talk about during this panel. So moving on, um, so the clinical years. Um, so the questions are, what general advice do you have for the clinical years for an aspiring IR? Um, what rotations are especially important and what should you take away from these core rotations? So these would be the third year rotations, IM, family medicine, um, surgery, and then also what elective rotations other than DR and IR did you find helpful? Examples, vascular surgery, ICU, et cetera. And do you have any insight on when to take step two CK and CS? And this might be varying depending on if we're talking about this upcoming year where things have obviously been super disruptive or a typical applicant year. So Adam, do you wanna take a stab at that? Sure. Um, so first question, what general advice do I have for the clinical years? I think that um, the first thing I would say is just like buy in, buy into, you know, the fact that you're there, you're part of a team, um, you know, do your best to integrate yourself as part of the team. I know some of you guys haven't started your clinical years yet. Some of you guys are just starting your clinical years. And you don't know what it's like, um, you know, it, it gets hard and, you know, it's, you know, you'll hear it's like team dependent, it's uh, rotation dependent, all these different things. Um, but, you know, I think, being a third, fourth year medical student is such a great opportunity to work with so many amazing doctors and um, other healthcare professionals. There's so much to learn just by um, observing, and you know, no one's gonna let you, you know, no one's gonna let you screw up, um, you know, for lack of a better word. So, take every opportunity you can to learn. That's that's number one. Um, I think that also, you know, again, like this is for aspiring interventional radiologists. I made a point on my rotations to represent myself that way. Um, not in like a, not in a rude way necessarily, but if somebody asked me what specialty I was going into and I happened to be on another rotation, I didn't lie and say that specialty. I said, I'm going to be an interventional radiologist and I would honestly use it as a, a time to teach them about IR or to listen about IR. And what you hear, you know, is that um, a lot of people in other specialties view IR from their scope of what IR can do for them. So to OBGYN, we embolize um, postpartum hemorrhage and steal their fibroid patients or uh, drain their two TOAs. Um, you know, it depends, it depends what specialty you're in, but I think it's important just, you know, as a medical student, as an MS3, you're not getting involved in that kind of conversation and, and um, you know, getting involved in a turf war, so to speak, but it's important for you to start to listen to what other people have to say about IR. Um, I think that's like a really unique chance that you have as a third, fourth year medical student to be a part of a team um, and to, uh, you know, kind of learn about the perspective of IR and of diagnostic radiology. Um, and to that end, I think a lot of uh, my panelists, I'm sure, were like this on their rotations too, um, because, you know, we all we already said why we love IR and how um, we interact with so many different specialties and. Um, of course, radiology, diagnostic radiology too. Um, every single rotation that you're on, you're going to have a chance to interact with interventional radiology and diagnostic radiology. 
And when that, um, when that chance arises, like you want to be the one following that patient um, and coordinating their care um, with IR, scrubbing in, following that patient to IR and scrubbing in on that procedure if you can. Um, because not only are you helping your own team out, you're helping the patient out um, and you're um, putting yourself uh, on good footing with the people in the interventional department before you do your rotation with them. Um, and they know that you're going to back for them, um, you know, in the rest of the hospital. And those kinds of things actually go a really long way. Um, what else? I think like the general clinical year advice also is just like know your patients inside and out. It's going to be the same uh, expectation magnified in term year. So the better you get at carrying one patient, then two patients, then three patients, then four, and just knowing everything about them, talking to the family, um, just be, you know, become a part of the team. Your day will go by faster. You're, you know, you'll, you'll just enjoy it more. You'll learn more. Um, but rotations are important. Um, you know, medicine and surgery, obviously, those are, you know, crucial. Each institution has different lengths of time, I think. Um, I would say surgery a little bit more than medicine um, gets you prepared for like the pace of IR and the, the energy required um, to be on your feet all day, kind of running up and down, rounding a little bit earlier. Um, but, you know, you may only get like if you're if you're going into a surgery integrated uh, IR program, you know, my eight weeks of internal medicine, that was it for me for you know my entire career at this point. Um, so it was important for me to learn. Um, like I said, taking every chance to learn. Um, so I think, you know, between medicine and surgery, I'll let um, others, you know, get into some of the other core rotations um, other than that. But like in terms of electives, um, I found vascular surgery. I did vascular. I was, you know, one of the rare students in my medical school class who requested that. I'm sure a lot of us are like that. Um, but it was very, very helpful to learn vascular surgery because they do so many things um, that cross over with IR, they interact with IR all the time, from PAD to aortas to um, tons of like dialysis work. Um, you learn, you know, clinical vascular medicine from um, vascular surgeons who are very protective over that, and they want to see. And again, I was that person saying I want to do IR, um, and that you know, from the vascular surgery standpoint, they were ready to see what I was made of in a lot of ways. Um, so that was that was a really important rotation. I did two weeks of the SICU. Um, I thought that was super helpful. A lot of patients um, in IR are getting uh, our, you know, surgical intensive care patients, um, a lot of transplant uh, kind of stuff in my hospital. Um, and then I think the last rotation, it was not an elective, um, uh, obviously DR, I'll let somebody else talk about DR, but I thought emergency medicine was a super helpful rotation, just like, you know, I think it's the pace of that um, department that um, kind of reminds me of IR. The personalities sometimes remind me of IR. Um, you're doing procedures. It's kind of a place where you can, you can like calmly practice your IV skills, things like that. Um, you know, holding an ultrasound probe, scanning people. You have a billion chest X-rays at your disposal. I mean, on the list every day. So I thought that was a cool rotation too. Um, and then step two and C CS and CK. I think this is a different. Um, answer for each individual person, honestly, and how their school schedules. Um, my personal uh, path, because I took medicine, surgery, and OBGYN in the second half of my uh, third year um, and had IR scheduled for that summer of fourth year, um, I felt that I wanted to take CK right after I finished medicine and surgery and OBGYN because that comprised most of the tests. And so I gave myself like a two or three week study period. Um, if I remember, um, right after those rotations, took my CK. Um, I dropped the ball on CS scheduling, which I'm sure others might have done. Maybe not. These guys could be smarter than me at that. But I ended up having to take my CS in November, um, like Thanksgiving, you know, um, which wasn't that fun. But yeah, so I guess my advice there is uh, plan to take CK um, at a low stress time. I think it, I also rationalized that it was good to take CK before I started my IR rotations because my head was just full of all the knowledge that I could possibly fill it with before going to try to impress on these rotations. And then um, in terms of CS, like before your school even tells you to sign up for it, pick a date that you want and that works for you and try to get, just try to beat everybody to it. That's what I should have done. 
Awesome. Thank you, Adam. There's some really great advice in there. Um, Hanson, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, I, I guess to echo Adam, definitely you'll want to focus on doing a great job on all your clinical rotations because radiology essentially touches every specialty in medicine. And you'll want to earn those stellar letters of recommendations, especially from these non-radiology attendings. Um, I think they will be an asset to your application. Um, and when you see opportunity arise, like it could be simple as like putting in an IV or uh, to participate in a procedure, definitely, you know, volunteer to give it a shot and see if you actually enjoy working with your hands uh, more than just the thought of it. And um, I, I also thought that vascular surgery was a great rotation to get some hands-on experience and to kind of learn uh, about endovascular procedures uh, from a different mindset. Um, for me, MICU wasn't too relevant, but it was a requirement for my school. Um, I definitely stress doing a DR rotation and seeing uh, it for yourself if you enjoy the diagnostic aspects, as it's very important for a career as an IR. Um, uh, you know, a lot of jobs out there are uh, a combination of both. And um, I guess in terms of step two, uh, for CK, I scheduled it a couple weeks after the end of my third year clinical rotations. And I thought it was the best time, like Adam, I wanted to get it all done before I start my away rotation. Um, and then, obviously, if you did really well on step one, you can choose to take uh, your step two later in the year and just submit with just your step one. Um, and you can maybe squeeze an extra away rotation, but these are all case dependent, I think. Um, in terms of CS, I would just recommend, you know, definitely study for the exam. It may be a different way of approaching patients than you were taught in school. So uh, I wouldn't blow it off. Um, I recommend taking it after CK, but try not to schedule too, too close. Um, so you don't end up blowing it off in favor of CK. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts here. Awesome, thank you, Hanson. Um, Lisa, do you have anything to add to any of these questions? Um, I mean, yeah, these are great answers. I'm gonna try not to repeat things, but um, kind of like, you know, we've touched on, IR gets consulted by pretty much every service everywhere. Um, what that means is you can take advantage of that and definitely seek out opportunities to actually follow patients to IR or, you know, be the one who talks to the IR consult fellow if uh, you have a report with the fellows. Um, as long as, of course, it doesn't interfere with your basic responsibilities as the student on that service, you still need to focus on being the M3 on that service. Um, but this way, um, it also helps align the rotation more with your interests. Um, it gets you familiar with kind of like the reasons why other services would um, consult IR. Um, uh, sometimes they themselves don't know that, as Adam mentioned. <laughs> sometimes it needs to help educate, but um, that can always be tricky from the med student perspective because you don't want to, you know, there's sometimes certain hierarchies um, in certain team dynamics. So just, you know, read the room, be respectful of all of that. Um, but it also actually can help the team and they can discover that if you are the person following them to IR, because then you can uh, relay the progress back to them in real time um and also get stuff done that maybe they wouldn't have been able to if they were just like you know the random person calling like one time um i was able to get us a um every single patient discharged off of the list in time for the july 4th weekend on surgery because the last patient was just waiting on a pick and they told them that they couldn't get the pick in and I went down and I was like, hey guys, so um, this lady like really only needs a pick. She's been on this for two days. Is there any way you can make this happen? Like, mm -hmm. this is the only thing she needs for discharge. And they're like, oh yeah, we totally get that. Like, we want her to go home for the, for the weekend. So they did the pick. Um, I did that pick with them. Um, and then they discharged her and my classmate and I got a golden weekend because they told us as our reward we didn't come in. <laughs> so <laughs> there are definite benefits to that. Um, similarly, like that was really helpful for vascular surgery because um, like they loved it when someone who like knows what's going on in the IR room can just like report straight back to the team. Yeah, we're done with the procedure. This is what happened. This is what um, like the recs are, the med recs are now. And um, um, it helps them because like the fellows are all pretty, um, 
pretty busy. Um, like the IRFLs are pretty busy and they need to like do all the notes and stuff. So if you can just relay that back um, to the vascular team in a timely fashion, then they really love that too. Um, so rotations are important. Um, uh, I don't know if that's like necessary, necessary. I took a surgery sub eye. It's something I would recommend. Um, some tips on that if you, um, for anyone who's uh, like M2 or younger and has the time to plan this out. Uh, I took my surgery rotation in third year at the start of my third year because I just kind of wanted to like start it off with that. Um, in retrospect, I think actually I wish I took it later, not because I wish I was more prepared for my surgery rotation third year, but because that would have helped me with my surgery sub eye. because since I took the um, surgery rotation so early on in third year, I had kind of just forgotten like a lot of basic things of like, you know, the floor of, oh, putting on like a vacuum seal or whatever, like just little things of like that you do your hands on the floor. Um, had left me after a whole year of doing other things and um, it would have just been a little bit smoother going into surgery sub i if you had already just come straight off of surgery third year um so um little recommendation there i also took vascular surgery as i mentioned i did do dr and then i did three ir ways at sinai usc and kaiser la so everyone's free to reach out to me um privately if you want to hear about my experiences with those um, they were all great experiences in different ways um, with any of those three or rush specifically as well. Um, I did want to fit in the ICU month, but I wasn't able to um, because of conflict with this global health opportunity to work at a, um, a Guatemalan primary care clinic for a month. And that's something I really wanted to do because, um, and this is not something I'm saying everyone needs to be fluent in every language ever, but for me, I wanted to be able to um, be comfortable with a certain level of medical Spanish because for IR procedures specifically, they're awake during all these procedures and just feasibly we aren't able to have an interpreter in the room or on the phone during the procedure. And um, I mean, usually, you know, we can get stuff done, but for, you know, for the patient's experience and also, uh, and also it does help things move on smoother if you're able to actually explain to them, like, why do you need to hold still? Um, this is why we're saying don't breathe, don't move. Um, what are your challenges to that? Instead of just yelling, notice you that like over and over again. You know, I know that that happens a lot, but um, you know that's not something that uh, we would do if there wasn't a language barrier. So um, it's something that I that was important to me to be able to bring to the team. Um, CK, yes, um, scheduling. So I, I scheduled mine fairly early on because again, I knew I needed something to prove. So if you're in that situation, definitely just, just do it. Like you need to do it early on. Um, uh, I don't know with the step one pass fail um, update, if maybe it'll end up being that everyone recommends that step two CK be taken early on, um, just because that's gonna be the one like numerical score uh, of the steps. So for those of you that, that that's impacted, um, I'm sure like, there will be a lot more talk about the pros and cons of that as that gets closer. But good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. I think that's some really great advice. Um, okay, so moving on, um, I think we're running perhaps a little bit behind schedule. I want to make sure that we hit all the points. So I think um, one way that we can maybe um, make sure that we're on time is that everyone try and pick two or three of the bullet point questions that really kind of speak to your experience or are relevant to your personal experience and focus on those and then maybe other people will touch on the other the other questions. Um, so now we're moving on to research. Um, so the first question is, first of all, were you involved in research? And if so, did you feel like it was helpful for your application? Um, do you residency programs look for or expect conducted research in, um, sorry, my series going off. <laughs> um, do they expect or, um, do they look for or expect conducted research to be specifically in IR or DR? And how would you recommend that students identify and pursue mentors? And do you think that it is important for students to attend and present at conferences? I think this was touched on a little bit in the choosing IR. But um, so Neil, do you want to expand on any of those? Sure. So I think the first two go hand in hand. Um, I was heavily involved in research. I strongly believe that research um, moves uh, clinical care. So for me, any opportunity I got, I did research. Um, if you're on a way rotations for fourth years, do research. Ask when I I, I did my uh, clinical rotations or my ways at Penn, 
uh, Sinai and Jefferson. And for each one of those, I asked, even if it was a case report or something, because one, it was me learning, um, and B, it was to show that I do care. Um, and if, again, you learn uh, different procedures uh, by doing research, different ways how IR is uh, implement, how IR is integrated in the patient's care. So absolutely do research. Does it matter if it's radiology IR? There's actually a couple of papers written about this. One, um, so I would look those up, but there was a correlation that was found um, that having IR research, uh, research does help. Um, I think if you're earlier on in your, uh, in your clinical years and you don't know, what I would suggest is just start with something. Having no re having some research is better than no research. Um, so start with something. I started, I first started with thyroid cancer, pediatric thyroid cancer, it had nothing to do with IR whatsoever. So um, start with something. Uh, eventually, I think it will be, it won't be looked down upon, but if you don't have something IR related, there's gonna be other applicants that will. So um, I do think having some IR related research, even if it's a case report, is helpful. Um, regarding research for uh, specific programs, there's obviously some programs that are heavily um, focused on research. Uh, so for those programs, they will care uh, that if you've done it or not. However, for the programs that don't are not research or don't produce much research, you'll just wow them. <laughs> so there's no, uh, you know, uh, it's a win-win. And what I'm trying to say is, um, I'll stop there. The only thing I guess I'll mention is the first person I met at a conference was Adam and back in like 2018. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, Adam's next. So if you want to tell us that story or. Perfect. I mean, yeah, I met all of these, all of you guys at uh, probably the first SIR it was, uh, or in LA. Um, not yeah. sure. I, honestly, the you know, I'll jump straight to the fourth point, and then I'll come back a little bit um, to one of the others. But do I think it's important to attend and present at conferences? Um, I think you know the people on this panel um, would be the first to tell you that. Um, that we do think it's important um, for all of us. I think it was one of the most important um, factors in just kind of developing our um, identity within the field. And as medical students in general, I think like having gone to um, multiple SIRs, um, symposia, you know, um, academic interventional radiology in DC, guests in New York, getting involved in all these conferences. Um, I think like medical school can be kind of mundane at times. Um, I know that I'm speaking to you know 150 of you who know that you know more intimately than I do right now um, in you know certain courses or, or rotations that are not as exciting as radioembolizing uh, a liver tumor in my opinion. But you get to go to a conference and you get to hear um, the best in the world talk about these things um, and you know what the new developments are. Um, you can present, obviously you can present posters and that's your ticket to getting in or, you know, if you're lucky enough to have an oral presentation, um, that's a great way to set yourself apart. And those are some, those are some goals as you get to like third and fourth year. Um, but as a first and second year, even I, like I would go to conferences without having any um, research to present and I would just walk around and shake everybody's hands. And that's how I became friends with all uh, these guys. Um, we were all on the same team and meeting attendings and meeting um, residents and it kind of just, it helps so much. And then upon returning to medical school each time, I had a new like level of motivation, a new you know um, wind behind my back in terms of being passionate about why I was there. Um, so you know, like I said, getting research, research I think is like Neil um, covered it. It's very important I think, um, just because it kind of has become a little bit of the expectation. I won't say that it's absolutely a hundred percent necessary to do it. Um, but if so, I think, like I said before, if you're not the research person, um, you're going to have to show that you're the something else person, whatever that might be. Um, and, you know, I think research is something that's a good thing to try regardless, um, because you might have a knack for it, you might like it, um, or you might decide that you, that it's not for you. And that's kind of, you know, it's kind of a trial by fire thing. Um, and I think the most important thing in this whole, um, conversation is that third point 
is finding the right mentor. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of advice there out on this and um, it can be, it can be difficult and you, you may not realize what um, is right for you at a certain time. And, you know, an MS1 looking for research um, may not know the right questions to ask uh, of a mentor or, you know, the right uh, qualities to be looking for in a mentor. So um, with, you know, my experience, I would say um, finding mentors that have a track record of working well with medical students is probably the easiest way to figure it out. And, and figuring that out is by going to the third and fourth year medical students at your school um, who have done research and they, they're going to be your best um, resources, working with residents, working with fellows. Um, but, you know, being the best mentee you possibly can be means like if somebody, you know, you have to maintain that relationship just as much as they do because, you know, a lot of the, let's say a lot of the mentors that work with younger medical students tend to be the younger attendings themselves who are starting families and they're, you know, a little bit busier um, in actually practicing IR and um, you have to be a part of that team. You have to get things back quickly. Um, once you commit to something, you know, you're, you're a colleague of, of, of a real life doctor. So like take that seriously. And um, yeah, I think, I think it can be a great experience um, if you maximize your time and, and um, you know, also, lastly, like Neil said, like learning from it. And the more you learn from your own research um, and the more you learn by just reading articles, the more, you know, the better doctor you'll be in the end. And uh, once you get to your interview and they scroll down your resume and they're like, oh, tell me about this project you did two years ago, would you learn from it? And you, you, you better know what you did and um, why it's important, why it's relevant. Awesome, thank you, Adam. Some, re some really great advice there. Um, and moving on to Varun, do you have any yeah. thoughts on any of these? Yeah, certainly. So I think that it's pretty important to clarify something. Like, uh, I think people like to divide research into, okay, um, that program directors really only care that you've done some research of some value and committed to a project, whereas other people in our field say that, oh, it needs to be IR, clinical, technical, high level research. So um, based on like uh, my personal experience um, conducting research in medical school, going about the trail and talking to these guys and fellow applicants, um, I think that the important element of research that programs really look for is can this student distill down scientific concepts into a clean presentation and speak in front of a random set of people, their, their co-students, work with the team in a research setting, including uh, residents, fellows, and attendings, and whether they have that initiative to begin with. Um, I think that distillation of principles and concepts and taking it to a finished product, whether that's in DR or IR or neurosurgery or, or anything really, is very important because you'll need to distill very complex patients down into progress notes and agent keys and talking about them at tumor boards and vascular conferences. And I think that that is a really helpful way that program directors can see that, okay, this person has kind of a fringe interest in, I don't know, petrosal sinus sampling to reference something that I was um, presenting at the NIH. Um, but yeah, so, um, whether it's important for students to attend and present at conferences. So I uh, was fortunate in, in some great mentors that I have, Rune, that we actually share some of these mentors, uh, but I was able to present oral presentations at the RSNA in diagnostic radiology, at the American Rentgen Ray Society in diagnostic radiology, and at SIR and some of the smaller like CIO and, and ISAT. And, you know, some people might argue that, oh, you know, like a, a smaller conference isn't as hefty or as worthy as your RSNAs and your SIR, but I, I strongly disagree. And I think that the more you're able to distill down, you know, even if it's a literature review of interventional radiology literature and engage with people and network in a conversation about something, I think that really speaks to your advantage for sure. So um, some advice to students approaching research projects. You know, our time is very limited um, in medical school and, you know, um, I've, I've seen it happen with, with students uh, and fellow applicants that, you know, um, you feel very overwhelmed by the pressures of 
publishing and, and being very high performing. So I think that's some basic questions to ask mentors is um, you're kind of expecting a, a baseline set of expectations. And I think the only expectation you can have of a, of a mentor uh, as a, a first or second year medical student is that they'll communicate with you well. Um, that if you start a project with them that, you know, the timeline is four months and, and um, you know, oral presentation or four months and it's a, uh, retrospective analysis that they'll communicate with you if things change and they'll mentor you along the way. I think that that's really the only criterion I would use. And, you know, I think that IR is very helpful, but I think that if you have like adjunctive disciplines like transplant surgery outcomes for hepatic or artery thrombosis or, you know, advanced imaging of the aorta using um, artificial intelligence, another shameless plug for, for something that I investigated. Um, that I think that those things are are very helpful. Um, and you know, not all institutions offer interventional radiology research to medical students. They reserve that for residents and fellows. So institution dependent, I think that to summarize, the most important thing is to um, find mentors and establish a very open communication style relationship with them. Um, and to most importantly, work on stuff that you yourself are passionate about. Like um, if you're interested in, stroke outcome research related to neuro IR, dive into that. And, you know, with, with a lot of hard work and passion that will shine through with the results of the research, as well as when you talk about it at a podium or at a poster, like, you know, it's, it's a real pleasure for people to see you come alive um, as you talk about your research. And I think that speaks volumes about your passion for IR and just being a really all around passionate person in general, which I think is very favorable trait uh, for anyone I, I or any of us would want to work with as well as in a candidate. Thank you, Varun. Um, I, I think that perspective that you brought up that the value of research is less about the content, though the content is still very important, but more about the critical thinking skills that you develop and how you translate that to residency. That that makes a lot of sense, and I think that's, that's a good opinion. Okay, um, without any further ado, let's move on. So we're going to move on to extracurricular involvement. So the questions are, what extracurriculars were you involved in? And did you feel like they benefited your application? And then the second bullet point is, all of you are alumni of the Medical Student Council within the SIR. Could you speak to the role that the MSC played within your educational career? And what advice would you give to a student who wants to get involved in IR leadership? And we will be starting off with Hansen, who, um, if you're not familiar, he is actually the past chair of the SIR Medical Student Council and um, currently serves as the resident advisor for the MSC. So Hanson, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so um, to keep it short, in terms of extracurriculars, um, I really enjoyed working on websites, either for student clubs or research-related purposes, and that's how I actually first got involved with the MSC through being a webmaster. And I think joining the MSC was one of the most pivotal decisions in my medical school career because it not only allowed me to be immersed uh, in this community um, and working together with these awesome students, or I guess no doctors um, across the nation, but also gain valuable mentors that really helped me along the way. I think uh, MSC really helps facilitate that relationship. Um, and to really get involved, I mean, there's many different avenues. I think that uh, because the MSC application um, is, cycle has passed, uh, it's usually in March, April, or May, um, but you can still join um, through the reserves of the MSC and get involved with projects. And it's a really easy way to get uh, plugged into a small project and then if the next year you can apply to join the committee and be more involved across the years. Um, and I think that it is definitely uh, life-changing to, to be uh, part of this community and part of the MSC because it allows us an avenue to really advocate for us and the future of IR. Um, you know, if there are certain things that you want to see IR do more, you can uh, really focus on that. Um, and push uh, with the MSC in shaping those uh, proposals. Thank you, Hanson. Um, next, Varun, do you have any thoughts on, on extracurriculars in general, but also the MSC as well? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So um, uh, as far as local extracurriculars go, I think that uh, one extracurricular that 
many people do, if, if possible, is an interventional radiology interest group. Um, speaking of some student-to-student -student mentorship, I had people like John Doe, who's a current UC San Diego IR resident, and Emily Sturbis, who Lisa's is actually headed to um, Colorado. In fact, I think she just arrived. Um, but yeah, so I think that an IRIG is really important because you can really demonstrate a very strong interest in particular, in, in particular like sub uh, specialties within IR. Like at Jefferson, um, we founded the HCC Tumor Board Panel. Uh, where we had transplant surgery, radiology, uh, hepatology, general inpatient medicine, and, and IR um, all like speak up on cases, and we ourselves developed the grand round style hour long talk about HCC and, and its management. And we did the same thing with uh, pulmonary embolism response. Um, so those are very rewarding experiences that again um, help you build a lot of. Uh, advanced kind of developed knowledge about a particular clinical discipline, but also come application time, you can say, hey, like I developed this grand round style presentation on on X and Y, and you know it was a great experience, and I learned about the multidisciplinary aspect of IR in that regard. As far as the medical student council goes, I think, uh, and the SIR goes, I think it's just um, a reward and benefit all around. I would say some of my favorite experience of medical school were within the SIR, whether that's um, going through the annual meetings or working on projects with the MSC. Um, to, to be more specific, I co-founded the introductory IR curriculum, which Varun Danda is now seeing to completion and working with so many students across the country and um, you know, kind of seeing their passion unfold really helped me develop um, kind of some really strong leadership skills and you know um, having that passion kind of reverberate back with other students and applicants and, and seeing things move really forward is something that I could speak about at great length during interviews with program directors that hey I work with you know students all across the country and I, and I love it and we all love it too and we're building something um, really outstanding for, for the future of interventional radiology. And I think the RFS and the MSC specifically lends itself to projects like that, initiatives like that, um, where you know you have all the passion in the world and a highly motivated group of students. So uh, I think that any way a medical student can get involved with the RFS and the MSC, whether that be the reserves or otherwise, I, I would take it. And going back to an earlier question about how do you know IR is right for you? I knew it was right for me by engaging with um, our community, with, with these people here and, and many of the other um, uh, medical students who, who applied. But because SIR was canceled this year and, and there's no in-person meetings, I think that interacting with students in that regard is, is a really other uh, great way uh, to kind of ascertain whether or not this, this community is, is the appropriate fit for you. And as far as IR leadership goes, if there isn't an IR interest group at your school, you can be the founder and president of the newest IR interest group at your institution. And you know, like um, I think you can reach out to me or to Neil or to anyone because Neil founded the New Jersey Interventional Radiology Symposium as well. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities for initiative and, and the kind of unlimited currency it, for these extracurriculars are your fellow students will put in as much work and meet your passion every time. Um, so I think that's that's really helpful as well to build strong extracurriculars, not only for your application, but just for your for your own enjoyment, for your own uh, professional development um, as well. Other extracurriculars, just like, yeah, okay. I think I think that suffices for Okay, thank you, Varun. That, that was really awesome advice. Um, Okay, moving on to Lisa, do you have any thoughts on extracurriculars yeah. and the MSC as well? Mm -hmm. I'll try to keep it short. I know we're running tight on time. Um, specifically, I'll speak about my role in MSC. So um, uh, that was something where I started getting involved in second year. I believe it was Shantanu who actually encouraged me to apply because I was kind of like, I don't know what, what this entails, like what is this? And he gave me the whole spiel. Um, and uh, haven't looked back since. I somehow ended up the IR interest group chair 
this past year, um, taking over from Ricky, who was one of the first uh, like women in IR student, interested students I ever met, like ever. Um, so all these things come back full circle, right? Um, and then she passed the role on to me. Um, and now Norbert is the um, IRIC chair, so please reach out to him in the committee if um, you do want to start an IRIC. Um, just speaking about starting an IRIC, um, if there isn't one at your school or if there's um, a, a general radiology group or uh, what have you and you want to make further steps to have like an IR position in that group or create a separate IRIG, um, all you need to declare an IRIG with SIR, obviously it's different with each school, but with SIR, you literally just need like two people meeting at some point during the year to talk about IR specific things. That's the definition of IRIG by SIR. So it's really easy to get registered with um, the IRA committee and with SIR in general. The tricky thing obviously is continuity and making sure that it keeps up if you, um, if because those things can easily just kind of um, die if no one passes along that interest. Um, in terms of other advice to um, to getting involved, especially I know people are like concerned about um, with the current pandemic, it limits some options uh, with over rotations and getting to um, network with people. Um, there's a lot of opportunities on the SIR website that I think go like terribly, terribly unnoticed. Um, just look up like the grants and awards um, uh, like page on the SIR website. That's actually where I got like I think probably my biggest break. Um, there's this med student grant um, that I applied for back in M1 year. Um, and um, like, I think that was the thing that came up honestly most commonly in my interviews, people asking about that grant and the project that came from that. So um, things like that, there's also like, a, um, I mean, this is veering a little bit off, but just there's so many res like financial resources, not just educational resources on the SIR website, like the GEM scholarship and things like that. Um, uh, that's specifically looking for, um, looking to help a, a fund first generation. Um, um, uh, and then there's like a whole list of uh, uh, people that could possibly apply for it, like first generation, um, medical student, woman, um, underrepresented minority, et cetera. Um, so don't let those chances slip by. They're right there for the taking for you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, those are super great resources. And I invite anyone to check it out, the SIR grants page. I'm sure there's more that we didn't talk about. So definitely something to explore. Okay, I think we're gonna skip the slide for now, but get back to it at the end if we have time, just so we can get to the application process slides, just so that um, people that are in the fourth year, they have some content in that respect. And yeah, we'll skip this as well. Okay, so this is, we're moving on to the second half of the talk, essentially focusing more on the fourth year of medical school, the application season. Um, so this slide is about radiology rotation and more about the logistics side. So the questions are, how many rotations would you recommend that are IR versus DR and home versus away? Though the away part, um, if you want to tailor the advice to the current application season where aways have not been recommended due to the COVID pandemic, um, that would be also be a consideration. Um, also, the second question is along those lines, given the current pandemic, do you have any advice for current MS force who are unable to go on away rotation? And we'll start again with Lisa. Yeah, so I know that this is a really tough topic to talk about because everything's different for you guys. And quite honestly, we don't have firsthand experience on how to help this. This is just kind of a spitballing possible solutions for you. Um, the good news is everyone is in the same situation and also everyone knows that you're in this situation. So, um, you know, like we, we all understand um, some things uh, in regards to, well, first IR versus DR. Obviously, if you have a home IR rotation, take that. Take that for four weeks. Don't do a two-weeker. Um, and uh, stay until the last case. Do your best on that. Um, I know that things get tricky if you don't have a home IR program, especially now that aways are not a very feasible option, um, especially when you're worried about rec letters and things like that. Um, if you're really, I know we'll talk about rec letters later, but um, in regards to like an IR rec letter, you know, there's still ways you can get that from um, research or SIR involvement, things like that. Um, and then in terms of like rotations to kind of supplement that, that are IR focused during your fourth year still. We've talked about vascular surgery before. If there's a neurosurgery rotation, like take all of those. I know it's not the same as um, IR because they're 
these are things that are based off, you know, that specific patient and uh, disease process and not on the technique, but they use those techniques. So if you can um, make yourself look good on that rotation, then um, like I think those would be powerful letters to have. Um, and I, I feel like that's what a lot of people are looking for on a ways. Um, and also in regard to like the other thing that people look for on a ways is not just to um, uh, like, you know, make your, your right, uh, right your application look good. It's also for your own purposes of um, being able to figure out if this place is the right fit for you. Um, I've already had people reach out to me. I know people have been reaching out to others um, to talk about my experiences on my away rotations. That's something you can do. Um, I know that this is this is the our community. You know, we're all here to help. We're all willing to talk about our experiences as candidly as possible. Um, and we're, because everyone's going to want something different also out of um, out of what they want out of IR. Like I said, there's a huge variety in how your lifestyle can be and how things can go. So just talk to as many people as possible, treat every um, opinion with a grain of salt, but also just, um, you know, trust that we're trying to help you guys out. So we'll, we'll talk to you guys as honestly as we can. Thank you, Lisa. Um, moving on to Neil, do you have any input on this? Sure. Uh, to piggyback off what Lisa said, I think this is very individualized in what school you do come from. And um, again, if you do have a home rotation or not. So for specifically the students that don't have a home rotation, it is super important for uh, you to do an IR. I'll talk about it for your fourth year now. Uh, I'll talk about that later. But for the M1 to M3s, do an IR rotation um, if you do have a home program. If not, reach out to um, programs near you. For me, I didn't have one and I reached my first IR rotation was actually a pediatric IR rotation. And at first it was just shadowing and then I did research with them and then I learned that I could do a pediatric radiology rotation where I got to do uh, both IR and DR. Um, again, uh, I'm sure everyone on this panel can tell you New Jersey does go hard. Uh, all of the students uh, did about three or four rotations. Definitely not necessary, but um, yeah, um, all, all of the people that matched this year from New Jersey besides one did about three, three, three and a half. Um, so again, it's a two-way street. They're learning about you or they're grading you, but you're also looking if that's a place that you want to be at and kind of seeing like, you know, if that's, a uh, place you want to uh, train at or a place that encompasses everything that you're looking for in the program. For the MS4s currently, what I would suggest is reach out to program directors or residents virtually. I know <laughs> you skipped the whole Twitter talk, but just a little bit on this right now, and we'll talk about it later. Form a Twitter, even if you don't like it. I didn't like it before, and now I love it. Form a Twitter and reach out to directors, uh, residents about their program. Uh, a lot of them on it uh, are on it right now. I'm on my surgery uh, intern year, and literally every call that we have, they ask us to up our game on social media on Twitter because they want to show what they what their program is like. And I'm sure IR is going to be doing this as well uh, during these uh, rotation uh, during these uh, messages. You can learn more about the program. Um, you can also um, ask for research opportunities, right? You can maybe not over Twitter, but through the mentee mentor program, you can reach out to mentors from the specific institution that you're interested in and do research, right? That's kind of like your way of, if you want to use these away rotations to impress them, this is your way. Um, but other than that, I don't have much more to say. If you have any questions specifically for D, uh, for um, pro, uh, for schools that don't have a home institution, you guys can definitely email me. But um, yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, thank you for also touching up on the social media aspect, and hopefully, we'll have some time after to discuss it a little bit more. Um, but for now, um, Adam, do you have any thoughts on radiology rotation logistics? Yeah, sure. Um, I think um, what's cool about this panel, like Neil, like you said, I think Neil did four rotations. Lisa did a lot as well. Um, I had aimed to do four total IR rotations, three OAs plus my home. Um, these are all four weeks. I saw somebody ask the question in the, um, 
question box um, about doing a two week to four week rotation. Like if it can only, if you can only fit a two week rotation, obviously do that. But the more IR you do, the more reps you get in, the better you'll be. And, and you know, um, definitely recommend doing that full four weeks because learning a service takes, I think, exactly four weeks as um, clinical med students always find out. Um, so I think doing your home rotation first is the best idea. You can do that, obviously, this year without the aways. That's not the case. Um, but I think it like this year it makes that home rotation all the more important. Um, and, you know, how you can prepare for that by, you know, get, like, trying to learn as much as you can before you go in there. So we didn't really talk about it that much. I don't know if it's coming up later, but like the text reading certain textbooks, like the pocketbook of clinical IR, it's probably the first one I would recommend. It's very easy read, cover to cover. You can do it in a matter of a couple of weeks and, and you can learn everything you kind of need to know to be a, you know, well above expectations, honestly, for what um, most interventional radiologists expect from medical students in the past. Um, I think doing a DR rotation is extremely important. A lot of schools have it required. My school did, and I'm thankful for that, but some schools don't. I think um, maybe Varun mentioned it. I'm not sure which one of you mentioned it, but it's important to find out that you like to be in the reading room, that you enjoy um, the process of reading diagnostic imaging, because um, if it's not a part of your career later, which it probably will be, the um, majority of interventionalists do a lot of DR um, in practice, it'll at least definitely be three years of your residency. And that's, um, you know, it's really important um, that you decide that you can see yourself both as a diagnostic radiologist and an interventional radiologist, because ultimately you'll be dual certified in both anyway. Um, and then I would say, yes, yeah, so doing the way rotations, it's, it should probably go without saying, but somebody kind of mentioned it, that um, you have to go there with the expectation that you're going to perform at your absolute best um, when you're there. And I, I know this is going to be like a next year thing, but it's something for those students, the younger students, to start thinking about. Um, it becomes a month-long interview, um, so you, you really got to be on your game. Um, I, I rotated at um, Miami, obviously my home institution at Mount Sinai as well, and Northwestern. So if anybody has questions about that, you can reach out to me about those specific rotations. Um, and so given like the current um, time period, I think you know there will be fewer expectations, I think, on students to be um, you know, I guess skilled in IR. And I think like one of the cool things about doing four rotations or whatever is that you you become you know a master assistant of running the back table, and that can be really fun. Um, you get to see your skills increase, and you be, you start to really carry patients, and um, you feel like you're you're really helping out the team. Um, so um, it's unfortunate, but I think like somebody said, there's a lot of opportunity here to um, learn other other things, um, like you know maybe doing a second rotation in vascular surgery or, or things like urology or transplant or getting involved more in the ICU or doing another diagnostic radiology rotation and going that route. Um, at my school, you can do like an advanced uh, radiology elective for two weeks and pick the, whatever department you want to go in. And maybe you could loophole your way into doing another two weeks of IR on top of that at your home. Um, I would say it, and this kind of just this, this is kind of overall advice. It goes into extracurriculars, research, whatever it is. My number one advice for any applicant to residency, IR or not, is that you should have a story to tell that makes sense and that re like represents you well as a person um, and as as a future doctor. So, um, you know, when you're planning this, I think like um, especially during the pandemic, whatever you know you decide is the best plan for you, have a reason. You know, try to come up with like a real story and and and. Um, why this is going to make you a better resident and a better doctor, better person, um, whatever you choose to do with that time, because you will still have a lot of time. Um, I think, you know, one thing you might not want to fall into the trap of um, taking, you know, coasting on some easier rotations or other things. I know that's not that great to hear, but, um, you know, it will be expected of you to at least, you know, roll with the punches here, um, even though it really is unfortunate. Uh, and then Thank last, you, Adam. Mm -hmm. sorry, yeah, one, go ahead. Go ahead. If you, if you all, like a lot of you were interested in certain programs, there's no doubt that some of you are trying to get out of your certain med school, um, things like that. And now it's it, it's probably scary because you can't really get your foot right in the door and do that. So um, being aggressive, being like cautiously aggressive, I'd say about reaching out, um, remembering that you're always representing yourself. Like once you send an email to a program or you DM somebody, like automatically assume that's going into your file or whatever so always be professional but if you want to find out about a program and um, you know 
maybe vet those questions through some other people before you send them um, to program directors or attendings, residents, whoever they may be. I think, you know, nobody would, um, nobody would be, everybody expects that, I think, at this point. Um, so if anybody has, like I said, if anybody has questions about the rotation, the rotations I did, I'd be happy to answer them. And I'm sure um, others are on Twitter, um, through email, go on program websites, just try to find out everything you can. And, and like Lisa said, take every piece of information you get with a grain of salt, even what we're telling you now. Thank you, Adam. Um, yeah, you definitely touched on a couple things that we hope to dive into more in the upcoming slides. So thank you for that. Um, I know we are currently at the end of our kind of estimated time frame. Um, if all of our panelists can still go on, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, feel free to let me know if you have to leave. Hopefully, understand you guys are starting your intern years, so obviously crazy busy. Um, to our uh, audience members who may have to leave, also uh, please note that this webinar is recorded, so it should be posted on the the IR Education YouTube channel. So. Um, don't feel bad that you're leaving and missing out on some advice because it should be posted on the YouTube channel soon after the webinar. So you'll be able to rewatch it at any point. Okay. Yeah. So the next slide, um, success on radiology rotation. So um, going off what Adam said, what have you found to be helpful in your preparation for an IR clerkship? Um, and if you want also a DR clerkship, if you have that um, recommendation. And then how do you make the most of an IR clerkship? Uh, same question for a DR clerkship. And then any specific recommendations for students hoping to ask for a letter of recommendation for one of the faculty members um, based on an IR clerkship or a DR clerkship? And we're going to start off with Varun. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So I think that preparation for an interventional radiology rotation kind of comes in two flavors. Um, I think like the first would be the preparation you achieve before you even walk through the door. Um, I think that reading books like the IR Playbook by um, Dr. Nikki Keefe, as well as Pocketbook of Interventional Radiology, like Adam was mentioning, as well as Learning Interventional Radiology uh, by Stephen Key or Stephen Nikki, um, were all extremely helpful. And I found myself on my IR rotations referencing these books before I would go to a particular case. Um, so I think that you know, some people will tell you things like, oh, nothing can prepare you, like, just go in and jump in. And I think that, yeah, like, you could do that, but you could also, like, do what you've always done with anything and everything and, and show a bit of preparation because um, your book knowledge will show. And um, whether that's at, you know, rounds or just talking to attendings and, you know, that kind of extra set of competency will will help you distinguish yourself um if nothing else it'll it'll demonstrate your passion and i think that for an ir clerkship um you know attendings aren't expecting you or programs aren't expecting you to map out the you know uh, wire and catheter uh, assembly for an ivc reconstruction from scratch but what really will help you stand out as in any rotation is complete and total ownership of the patients. And that is spend as much time with your patients on IR as possible. IR is a clinical specialty and you are dealing with complex medical problems. And the better you know your patient's disease process, the better you will perform as a student. And most importantly, the better you will serve at, in the clinical care of those patients as well. So I think being prepared, knowing every lab value on your patient's chart, knowing their INR, knowing whether they need to be reversed, knowing their how their hemoglobin trended, whether you think there's something off with the exam and there might be a groin hematoma, or you know someone's drain isn't putting out well and you may need to revise the drain or you can pull the drain today, or you know, someone's McNamara infusion catheter for acute limb ischemia is, is clogged or, or looks funny or off. I think that all those things are extremely, extremely helpful. And, you know, like any other rotation, um, <laughs> not to sound harsh, but there's never an excuse that, oh, I didn't know how to prepare. Like, everybody is there to help you, including the fellows, the residents, the NPs, the nurses, the, the scrub techs on IR. So, the more you establish those relationships, like I would just say something along the lines of like, hey, I'm Varun, I'm the IR student, or I'm a visiting student. I was wondering if you could help me where I could find X or Y or 
what things should I do to prepare for this case? And you'll get a treasure trove of information that will actually also just help you make the most of your learning experience as well. With regards to um, a letter of recommendation within an IR clerkship, that is extremely important um, for away rotation. Sorry, current MS4s. Um, well, I'll address something for you guys as well. But I think that it's important to identify a mentor very early on and ask for feedback, which is different than and uh, my surgical internship at Mass General also just briefed us again on the difference between feedback and um, in the moment kind of corrections. You know, like if an attending is telling you like, oh, hey, you know, you're holding that wire kind of awkwardly, hold it like this. That's not the same as formal feedback. So, you know, kind of saying, hey, you know, um, thank you for having me in your division or the rotation. These are my goals for the rotation. I was wondering if you could tell me how I'm doing it and what I could be doing better. And you ask them, is there any time that you have where we could sit down and, um, you know, talk about, about those things? And if the answer is yes, that's great. That's a great start to, you know, building a, a, like a true mentor-mentee relationship, even in the span of four weeks, to, to get a letter of recommendation. And if they say no, that's also great news because that's not the person you ask for your letter if they don't want, they don't have the time for a couple of minutes for a sit down either. Um, so yeah, I think that's how you really maximize the most out of an IR clerkship. Um, thirdly, I mean, I know it's a pressure about fourth year student on a sub internship or whatever, but have a blast. Like, the, like there's there's so many amazing experiences, cognitively, technically. We all love IR because we love working with our hands. There's so many rewarding things, and when we say the back table is awesome. It really is like, you know, and as you move forward through weeks and different rotations and you get closer to a primary operator, it gets even better. So, you know, like savor it. And if people do give you in person like feedback that, hey, you're not doing this well or that well, like um, don't take it personally because they do understand that you are a student, not visiting IR attending. So, you know, I think that it's it's OK to kind of roll with the punches as someone was saying with regard to anything clinically and that goes for all of med school as well like if your first subcuticular stitch on surgery looks absolutely awful they have to take it out and you have to start from scratch so be it no one's holding against you everyone's kind of already forgotten as far as dr goes um just prepare well for the clerkship i mean <laughs> dr clerkships come in two flavors like you you come in shadow and they tell you to go home or like they have you do some academic work and you have tests and stuff. So just study for the tests and work hard on what they tell you to work. Thank you, Varun, for the advice on how to succeed on both DR and IR. Um, moving on to Hansen, um, do you have any thoughts on any of these questions? Yeah, the books that uh, those guys uh, suggested are really great resources. Uh, in addition, on our website, there's a IR clerkship guide tab that was newly uh, created and the, there you'll find like institution specific survival guides, IR procedure guides and uh, a link to a resource called step boards where it's uh, uh, they, they made videos on each step of what you would do in the back table so all of these are great resources I think the key is just to be proactive uh, look at cases coming up read about them watch the procedures the night before and you're surely impressed. Uh, for DR rotations, uh, be equally excited and demonstrate that you love radiology and not just IR. I think the easiest way to piss off some somebody is to say that I want to do IR and IR only and you're talking to DR attendings and I think you need to just express interest in radiology. Um, you should, you can even ask them like if they can go over a case with you or if there's an empty workstation, you can ask them uh, if you can look at a case uh, and then do like a, a pseudo readout with them. They won't expect anything, but you know, just giving your best shot uh, proves, um, shows to them that you're interested. Uh, yeah, and then in terms of uh, getting the specific recommendations, I think it's just, just showing interest um, and trying to be prepared. Those are the best ways to uh, earn yourself a strong letter of interest.
Bruno, hey, Bruno, I think you're you're muted. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, Neil, do you have any anything to add to that? Sure, I think um, Rune and Hansen covered most of it. Point of clarification, the back table is where all the tools are, uh, where all the wires and all the good stuff IR attendings use. And it's pretty cool that you can just manage the back table, kind of like um, be either a second assist and make sure everything's um, in order. Since we use a lot of wires and catheters and we interchange uh, them, uh, pretty frequently, so just keeping them organized. Um, that's really important. Um, regarding DR, I think DR is super important. Um, again, one of the I, one of the, like I guess like the pearls of a DR is uh, or having a DR rotation is when you see something uh, during your IR rotations, you'll have knowledge of. Uh, of actually like you know seeing an image before or how to read it it's not more about reading but it's more about like seeing what is happening so that's uh pretty cool um and i still remember i did a pediatric radiology rotation and i uh i stayed overnight and i saw an intussusception like it was like so cool and i got to like diagnose it and like I, we were both like the attending and i were both like excited about it so it, it has its pearls it's not as bad as uh people you know make it seem and as everyone echoed here uh or said here i'm gonna echo the same thing is dr is important for you to have that fundamental knowledge uh regarding specific recommendations one thing just to touch on is i know this year is different but for future years um your eras opens on september 15th or sorry is is due on september 15th so if you're doing a rotation starting in September, it may be hard to get a letter of recommendation. So I know each school is different, um, but if you can do your uh, your away rotations earlier, the better. Most of most away rotations don't let third years uh, third year students um, um, enroll in them. So it's mostly once you enter your fourth year in July um or august that's when that'll be your first shot um to do an away rotation uh so i would take that i, I would do, i would schedule it as early as possible if you're uh, seeking a letter everything else um every, everyone else had to stay stay late <laughs> arrive early take thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you neil um okay so moving on letters of recommendation um, so how many letters of recommendation did you submit on ERAS? What were the medical specialties of your writers? How did these writers get to know you? Um, were it through your core rotations, your sub eyes, your research mentors? And then one last question, knowing what you know now, what is the most important piece of advice you would give regarding um, letters of recommendation? And also there's actually a specific question on the Slido page that's very um, popular. Do you need a DR letter of recommendation or are IR letters of recommendation sufficient? And in general, how many weeks of DR rotations did you have, I guess, compared to the IR rotation? Sorry, that's a lot. I can repeat that last question since it's not on the slide. But um, Lisa, do you have any thoughts on any of that? Yeah, so um, how many LORs? Um, ERAS allows you to submit four. I would recommend if you can get four that are that you feel comfortable about, then do the four. Um, medical specialty of the writers. I did two, speaking of, do you need a DR letter or not? I did two IR, one vascular surgery, one surgery, um, surgeon. Um, so I did not have a DR letter. Um, uh, that being said, I didn't really apply to any DR programs that didn't that I wasn't also applying to the IR program for. So it was pretty much all like joint interviews. So I, I, if if you're in a different situation and kind of how you're trying to strategize that, um, then the, my situation would not be applicable to you. Um, how did these writers get to know you? Um, so like, I mean, the IR, we keep talking about how great the IR community is. I think I'm really one of my, the few of my kind of like friend group in med school who all are in like other specialties who can say like honestly that I, I've been so like blessed by these generous mentors just like across the country and like different institutions. I mean, um, like Rush um, obviously was my home institution and 
um, where I spent uh, most of my time. And I would just kind of go down there all the time, um, even if I wasn't on a rotation. Um, so <coughs> kind of hang out there <laughs> and see what cases I could whenever I could. Um, uh, so I hope they knew my name, <laughs> was it that way? Um, and I also did some research with them. Um, I also got a letter um, from uh, the people I worked with at Sinai, Dr. Fishman, I mentioned him, was the first person to ever talked to me about IR, so that seemed appropriate since he um, was the one who got me into it. And I also did some research with him. Um, and then the surgery letters were the ones that I got like during fourth year, um, kind of more more last last second, I guess you could say. Um, so I did my sub eye and Sir John got a letter from her and then uh, vascular surgery right after that. Um, and um, and I guess just I didn't try to hide on any of my DR applications that I'm clearly like looking for IR. Um, I think I didn't want to be dishonest to myself or to them and it would come out fairly obvious I think no matter how you try to hide it um so um i i felt that that was probably the most honest way to go i think just the most important thing is that you know that these writers uh, have good things to say about you and also um like the thing to consider is um especially like for surgery people like people will talk um about who's a good letter writer um it's not just about like how like sometimes you actually may want to go not just with the person who knows you best but actually like the person who writes the best letters like that's a thing in surgery especially that i would hear over and over again so um use that as you will basically like um some people just know how to write good letters and then last thing most important advice um i wish this is something i did um that i um i feel like i could have maybe caused a little less stress in my life um asking for two letters more last second and um ask someone for a letter during my third year rotations instead um, if i had the foresight to um to uh, ask immediately after i was done with rotation with them so keep in mind keep an ear out for who are good letter writers if you um strike up a good relationship with someone who you feel like would write you a good letter um, then you should just ask that for them to keep you in mind uh, right away thank you lisa um Varun, do you have any thoughts on letters of recommendation? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I'll fly through this because I know we're running short. So I submitted four on ERAS. Um, I had two IR letters, one DR letter and one medicine letter. So my two IR letters from, from away rotations, from mentors that I identified kind of early on, had that sit down with, um, did like, you know, some really awesome cases with who got to know me very well personally and clinically. Um, my DR letter was from a very long-standing uh, DR research mentor who's known me extremely well for like three years and has mentored me extensively. So that was the DR letter. Um, as far as the fourth letter, which kind of goes with some advice as well, I actually went with an internal medicine letter because this um, was from a third-year medicine letter. And um, this attending of mine just knew me extremely well. I did great clinical work with the attending. We had an extremely good rapport. So I actually ended up choosing that letter over some other ones as well. Um, and then another thing is, if somebody offers you a letter in med school, say I would love and be honored by a letter of recommendation from you. At the end of, of um, uh, like by application time, I had eight or, I know I had eight letters of recommendation. Um, just because I'm a neurotic person and I, I, I just wanted them in as early as possible. That being said, um, you know, you know, maybe it's okay to fib once in a while and tell your, um, you know, attending that like the the deadline for letters is like September 5th or 10th or something, or you'd really love to have it in by then, because you know people will give you tons of anxiety and let's like, submit it on September 14th or something like that. So I think um, along along that same vein, just asking early and being like hey this is kind of due so please do it soon whenever you're free thank you varun um hansen do you have any thoughts about this as well yeah so for uh, i was in the same boat as varun i asked for more letters than i probably needed um you just don't want to be caught off guard you know somebody who wrote it late 
and it delays your application because you want to submit it you know on the day of it opening so um i also applied to prelim medicine surgery and transitional year so i had asked a lot more because i wanted different combinations for each and for ir and dr applications i tried to actually separate them a little bit um not that i was trying to hide that i was you know doing ir but i wanted to have dr letters for dr and ir letters for ir so in the end it turned out to be for dr i had a dr clinical and a dr research and then my ob letter and internal medicine from my ir i had my ir clinical ir research ob and surgery uh, and then for prelims i did ir dr surgery uh, medicine um, so uh, i think the breakdown was just i was thinking more procedural for the ir um, applications and then more uh, letters speaking about my clinical care for dr um, i think you, there's no real wrong way to do it just whatever you feel comfortable um, I will say that I recommend, um, you know, get attendees that know you well and you know will write exceptional things um, because most letters are going to be really positive and good, but you want like the very highest quality ones. When you ask them, you want them to write you a strong letter of recommendation. And um, maybe this is a concern for others as it was for me, but my institution didn't really have very well known IRs. And I don't think it is a deterrent um just you know have the people who write you the letters make sure that they are writing very you know well things and speak on specific qualities and you can even tell them which qualities you want them to kind of highlight uh to kind of build this picture um uh, for your application thank you hansen that was that was really good advice um, and thank you for addressing the, the question on Slido about DR letters specifically. Um, okay, moving on. Um, I know we're moving a little bit um, beyond time, so we're going to kind of breeze through some of the slides and maybe skip over some of the lesser um, important ones. But I think this is a relatively important one. But I think I'll just, instead of going down the panel, I'm just going to ask if anyone has any really strong advice or really feels compelled to speak on something that um, regarding personal statements. I guess the second question, the first question is the most important. Knowing what you know now, what is the most important piece of advice that you would give regarding the personal statement? And sure, anyone so can jump in. Yeah, yeah. So um, Varun, we've talked about this at length as well. So I have extremely strong feelings uh, regarding a personal statement. And that is like, please, 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 like keep it relatively short. Nobody wants to have to flip a page. That itself is a red flag. Um, so, you know, make sure that you're really distilling down a couple things, um, your passion for the field, um, very personal elements about who you are as a person, um, and try and make it kind of show together very seamlessly and um, ask a ton of people to revise it. I have been, wor I was working on mine for months and only in the last like three or four percent of my preparation time to write it that I feel like it really came alive um, and you know don't be afraid to edit and re-edit it as much as possible recruit advice from your brother who is a literature or law professor um, from your attendings from your deans I had a great dean uh, Dr. Stephen Heron review mine who's a gastroenterologist a ton of times and um, I think like that's what really made the difference so whoever is giving you the most detailed feedback don't be afraid to show them your second or third or fourth revision. Um, I would definitely not recommend uh, writing distinctive personal statements. But again, that's a that's a personal viewpoint. I think that you can write one personal statement where you can express your passion for interventional radiology as well as diagnostic radiology. Thank you, also use the same thing for prelims. Didn't even remotely address that a final prelim program. Same, <laughs> one size fits all. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for addressing that. Yeah, especially about the prelims. I'm sure people have questions about that. Um, and I think there's also a lot of resources online about the distinct um, personal statements for IRDR and PDs have also have some resources on that. So definitely check it out. Um, does anyone else have any um, thoughts about the personal statement that they would like to share? 
I'm just going to jump in with a different perspective, just because I think, I mean, we've, we've always been saying that no one size fits all for anyone. So if anyone out there does end up feeling like, oh my God, what do I do? I like really don't know how to cut this down to less than one page, which was me. Um, or, you know, I like kind of wrote this generic thing at first and then it just didn't really feel like it was adding any, like for me, I, I wasn't sure what value was adding to my application. So um, from, I also had an English minor in, in college, so I was kind of really obsessing over this. So not everyone's going to be like me, but for those of you out there who kind of wanted to go a little out there, like a personal or distinctive flair, um, like I wrote, I opened with baking and I talked about cronuts and, um, and everyone asked me about it. So I think it helped. So at, at least for me to be like remembered as the baking person, mm -hmm. I basically compare like baking to IR and how I love them both because they're both an art and a science together because you need like creativity, but it's also all science and all that good stuff. Um, and people remembered it, like people clearly read it. Um, so uh, I think the basic minimum is don't come across as a, as a weirdo or someone that you wouldn't want to sit next to or spend the next five years working with. Um, that's the most basic thing about personal statements. But other than that, if you really want to take it to that next level, then um, my best advice would be don't just regurgitate your resume. Use the items of your resume and talk about your motivations for why you did some accomplishment. What did you learn doing that accomplishment and build a story from there as to who you are. Because the rest of the application, that's that's already there. The personal statement is for them to find out your personality and what you value, and also what you can bring to the program as a resident. Like I really emphasize that I am looking for a place where I can grow as a mentor because I've had such great mentors, I want to now give back to the community. And that was a big sticking point in my interviews as well. So I was like consistent with that personality trait. Um, so, you know, don't like make stuff up or anything, have a consistent story and show, don't tell. Thank you, Lisa. Um, really quick, just go mm -hmm. bullet, yeah, absolutely. bullet by bullet. <laughs> Thank you. First bullet, they read it. <laughs> they read it, so uh, write a good one. Um, don't lie. Make sure it's grammar proof. Like all the all the same tools apply when you apply to college uh, and med school. Um, second, I was not like Varun. I wrote one separate for a DR and one for IR. The prelims I kept the same. Um, but I wrote, I love video editing. So for my diagnostic for DR, I wrote all about how, like, you know, being uh, like editing film or analyzing film was like second nature to me since I love doing it. Make it personal and mention if there's sp a, a particular um, things that you love about IR, mention that. For me, I wanted to be at a program that had a lot of leadership. Again, I want to be, mentors got me here. I want to be a mentor for others. So I mentioned that very distinctly, that and research um, in my essay. Thank you, Neil. Um, yeah, I really great points that you hit on. Adam, do you have something to say? Yeah, yeah. One, one, like not gonna really talk about much, but just one piece from the first bullet point, like a concrete uh, thing you can do. It's something I did. Um, when I was in MS1, I started a an iPhone note in my phone randomly called personal statement. You can do that now if you're watching this. Um, and as you go throughout med school, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you think about something, just word vomit into this note. And by the time I was ready to submit that, you know, I wrote it in, during conferences and conversations I had with people and all those things. And um, ultimately, it let me just kind of like build something um, at the end and, and to not scare everybody like like uh, my personal statement did go over one page too just barely but like I felt after multiple edits that like I couldn't quite take it out so I think like as long as like I said if you have your story um, if it's if it's long it better be like intriguing to read and not boring that's that's what I'll say on that um, but it is your one chance to kind of just like you know be different from the rest of your black and white application Thank you, Adam. Yeah, that's a good. That was a good um, advice to pick up that notes app and just type personal statement just to see what ideas flow in the moment. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, and again, I'm sorry to kind of have to rush things. Obviously, 
we'd love to hear you guys talk all night, but obviously that's not possible. Um, so yeah, I think another thing that we might do is convert this webinar into kind of an article format where you guys could potentially add in your responses to some of the things that you weren't able to touch on. So that's something we can definitely look into after to try and make sure that everyone has their input and get a diverse set of experiences. Um, I think we're gonna skip this slide for now. I think we're gonna skip this one as well. I think we're, I think we're gonna focus on the second bullet point here real quick if anyone has any input on this. Um, would you recommend any contact with residency programs uh, between submitting the ERAS application and then receiving an interview invite? So that I think this is a little bit of a gray area that some students kind of fear and don't really know how to approach. So if anyone on the panel has any kind of thoughts about that. And we can start with Hanson, because yeah. What um, Adam was saying earlier is that anything that you write and put in writing to a program, whether it's a Twitter direct message or an email, will automatically go into your file. Um, so I think I'd be very careful in, in how you construct communication. But um, I think that, uh, I personally believe that early communication is good and expressing strong interest in a program and also a couple of reasons why is, is always a good thing that, hey, I love your program. I especially love learning about so-and-so's research in um, you know, immunoembolization here. I myself am interested. I would love to be considered by your program. Awesome. Um, anyone else have any thoughts about this? My thought on this uh, may be different from others, but I didn't want to cloud any extraneous information on because I was thinking, you know, if they if a program invites me, they they want me to see me there. And I didn't want to cloud that with extra like, you know, if I wrote them an extra letter and I don't know if, you know, they ended up um, selecting me because of, uh, you know, uh, just uh, not in their systematic review. So because I, I didn't want to attend an, uh, an interview that I didn't think I have a good chance of landing the spot uh, is what I'm trying to say. So in, essentially I held all communication from programs after I submitted my application. I waited for the, the, uh, the invitation if it comes. Um, I didn't do this, but I know others have that if they didn't get an invite the first round that they would send a letter of interest expressing all the great things, you know, and why you deserve to go there. Um, and I know that that has generated a lot of uh, interview invites maybe not a lot but uh, select uh, people have definitely gotten uh, have gotten success with it um, in the end did people end up matching at uh, those institutions that they may not have gotten an invite the first round uh, that is a question that <laughs> actually Lisa and I have been trying to look into more and uh, we hope to get some uh, more data for that to share with others. Thank you, Hanson. Um, um, yeah, go ahead, Neil. Yeah, I I believe that any correspondence before, early correspondence is honestly the best. So if you can do it before ERAS, but I think after submitting um, the application, I, was, I took a different route than Hanson. Um, I did contact them and I believe that my application may not have been seen because I was a DO. Um, and that was just something like, you know, I thought if they just went like, you know, some schools just have that, um, that they have some type of cutoff or something, but that did actually, uh, land me some invites. Um, and yeah, I don't, I think it's good to like, you know, I know IMGs have done this as well. Um, so if that's something, you know, you're thinking about just contacting uh, PDs, I think do it. Don't be annoying. Send it once, keep it short. Um, don't go overboard um, and don't lie. Don't say it's your number one or anything if it's not. Thank you, Neil. Um, I think what we're gonna do, cause this question, I'm sure everyone had very different approaches as already illustrated. So this might be a great question that we can just kind of pull you afterwards. And if you guys just put a written kind of statement that way, everyone just has six or five different perspectives and see which one fits for their, their personal experience. So thank you. Um, moving on, interviews. I guess um, the big question to focus on is the third bullet point. 
Um, and we've heard this pa in the past PD panel of what they kind of think about virtual interviews and their recommendations. But as from the students' perspective, obviously you guys didn't experience virtual interviews, but if you have any advice for a student that's going to go on these virtual interviews to IRDR programs, what would you say to them? And anyone can jump in. I would say practice. Um, I had a virtual interview for a surgery prelim and a couple of phone calls with surgery prelims. Um, and I found them to be much harder than my in-person IR uh, interviews because there's always that weird pause when you're, you're waiting for the other person to finish. And you may be not, you know, your body language, all that may not translate well uh, with a virtual interview. With that said, what you can do is practice. Practice with a friend online, um, you know, with another med student and just see how it goes, see what things you can improve on. And first impressions matter. So, you know, interview in a well-lit area with good internet connection. You don't want to, you know, have your connection break up in the middle. And this is a, maybe a random thought, but, you know, if you're in a room like in an office and you have like a random prop there, it may spark a conversation or something. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, don't make it superficial, but, you know, it, <laughs> you can try to play things out uh, that you feel comfortable with. Thank yeah, you. Keep um, that Irad t-shirt in the background for <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone else have any thoughts about virtual interviews? What I, I would, oh Lisa, you go ahead, you're next here, if you wanna say something. Um, I guess uh, maybe just an attempt to comfort you guys, uh, everyone's figuring this out, and including the uh, attendings and residents who will be interviewing you. I'm sure there's gonna be just as many technical gaps on both ends. So, um, and just in general, IR uh, and DR interviews always have felt kind of just pretty chill, honestly. Like they just wanna get a sense of who you are, um, if you're consistent with what they've seen on the application. Um, and of course, just, just practice so that, um, because, it can be one thing to um, feel like you can just be true to yourself, but um, but also it just helps to like know how to be most articulately true to yourself by talking it out with a friend first. So I think it's I think um, I think it'll be fine. You know, I think everyone will understand and it'll be fine. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm gonna like talk a little bit about just imagining that. And like, let's say it's not virtual, but I know it is virtual, but the same things are gonna apply in, in terms of, uh, sorry, my computer just went a little nuts. Um, the same things are gonna apply in terms of like, you know, speaking eloquently, articul articulately, um, and, uh, you know, showing passion for IR. Um, those things you can still do through the screen, I think. And so like, um, I think Hanson was saying, just practice, practice those answers. And I think we're gonna get to that, um, like what questions will actually come up. Um, but you know you can you can still have a normal conversation I think through the virtual interview you guys will get better at it because you're going to do it so much um, as the interview season goes along so maybe if you have the chance to schedule certain important interviews later um, that could be advantageous to you um, I think you're still going to have you know one of the biggest things about interviews in person where you know are the interview dinners um, the night before the interview and just the general interaction you have with residents on tours and like the lunch in between or like when you go to noon conference or whatever it is. Um, I have a feeling, I'm sure the PD spoke more about this, but they're gonna try to artificially create these kinds of things for you. Um, feel it out, I would say, and you know, try to be, just try to be yourself and give your best, best impression of who you are kind of in a group setting because that's normally what you get to do in those situations. Um, don't be afraid to ask the residents on those calls, like the real questions and stuff. It will be a little bit different, um, no doubt, than the interview dinners themselves. But I still think those are um, like the same thing still applies in terms of they they are interviewing you just as much as you are also interviewing them. And I know people uh, beat that all the time, but it's it is true. Um, there's so much for you to learn about these programs, and since you can't physically be there, um, like you got to try to squeeze out everything you can. Um, definitely. Don't be, you know, annoying. Don't be the person on the Zoom happy hour that doesn't speak at all, but also don't be the person that's, you know, speaking the entire time. Um, 
And then, you know, if I were in your shoes before the interview, um, aside from practicing itself, I think just like one of the things that happens on an interview day naturally is that, you know, you might wake up in the hotel, you get dressed, you eat breakfast, like you, it's kind of a normal day. You get an Uber, you're talking to the Uber driver, and then you see all your co-applicants in the lobby and you're chit chatty and you're eating breakfast and you're kind of like warming up to the interview itself and it's a full day. Um, but in this case, you might be interviewing at your number one program and you have to just jump right on the phone, jump right on the screen and you're talking to the program director and you've been imagining this moment for four years. And that can sound stressful because that's that and that might actually happen and that's something you need to be prepared for. So I, one thing that I would do if I were in your situations is that I would just warm up before every single interview by calling a close friend, family member, somebody that I'm comfortable with, or calling a resident and talking about IR, or whatever it is, like um, whatever you need to do to, to get yourself into like a, a zone of talking, because not everybody can do that, even the most talkative of you know, extroverted people, that's a difficult thing. So um, that's my practical advice would be to warm up before you uh, start talking to somebody. Awesome, um, thank you Adam and Lisa for that. Um, so the next slide is actually more about the interview, but I think for this slide, we're gonna convert this to a text format. Maybe I'll survey you all afterwards, just cause these are kind of very list type questions like what type of interview questions we can just generate a list, hopefully. And then we can get that out before the current application interviews start. So then people have an idea of what they might be asked. And then also in terms of what questions you can ask, Residency programs, we can do the same thing for that, just for the sake of time. Um, so this slide, I think we can also skip for now since it's not super urgent for the people that are currently entering the academics, uh, the interview cycle, um, but we can also put something out in text format just in terms of how um, you decided your rank list at the end of your interviews, what factors went into it, um, and do you have any advice for the applicants regarding the rank order of IR, DR versus DR only programs. But if anyone has any like strong thoughts about that right now that they just wanna get out, like feel free at this point. Um, I know that you skipped the question earlier about how to select um, where to apply to. That might be yes, yes. more relevant actually though. Sure, absolutely. This, though. Um, so yeah, just, why don't we talk about that actually? Just really briefly, um, talk to people, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know I keep mentioning like I'm really lucky that I do have a home institution and it, it's Rush and they're great and supportive and like Dr. Arsene and Dr. Tasse specifically talk to them very honestly and I felt comfortable doing so about um, their opinions on um, programs that were um, you know realistic or um, uh, what the recommendations were that they would, would be a great fit for me. So if you have that opportunity, take it. Um, other than that, we are a resource as well. So just continue to reach out to, um, if, if you don't have that um, relationship with Tetting, then just reach out to um, newly matched or um, older residents about their thoughts as well. Awesome, awesome. So I think that'll take us to this last slide, just kind of just a free for all. Um, so anyone can kind of talk about e either that last question or these questions on the slide, which are just general questions about um, what factors in your application do you think contributed most to programs offering you to an interview? And then also what factors in your interview and your application contributed to the school that you eventually matched at? And then do you have any additional advice for medical students or any application process? So again, just general advice, if something that hasn't been covered in the panel. So anyone can jump in with that. Uh, I can jump in. I think just my overall advice, and I'll, I'll say it, I'll repeat it again, because I said it before, is that overall you want to have a story um, from your research to your extracurriculars, to your personal statement, to your letters, um, and following through with the interview, you know, killing the interview, and like that way, that person, they're going to write down stuff about you during the interview. They might, you know, score you whatever institution it is. But ultimately, when they come back to make their rank list or whatever, they know exactly who you are and you've left it all out on the table and you have, you know, nothing you know, is left unturned um, in their eyes on, on who you are, and what kind of resident um, you're going to be. So I think like, um, you know, proving it on interview day is important because, it, you know, they are interviewing you for a job for 
six years, you're going to be the person that they're going to be, these attendings, they're going to be texting in the middle of the night with, if, you know, there's a GI bleed coming in and you're the person on call and like, you know, you're going to be interacting with their families and, and I don't know, you, you really are going to immerse yourself in these programs um, if you, wherever you land. So that's what they're looking for. Um, just try to be your best self and um, any specific advice. I know we got into a lot of details. If anybody has any questions, um, I, my DMs are open anytime. I still have two weeks. I'd be happy to talk on the phone. Um, I'm here for you guys. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Adam. And we also have all of your contact information, um, emails and Twitter handles on the next slide. So, um, but first, does anyone else have anything to add in terms of general advice about any topic that was covered or any topic that wasn't covered or that we had to skip in this presentation slash webinar? I can go. I can talk about um, first for osteopathic students and then um, just in general for all students. I think I'm just reading some of the questions and one would mention if it's harder for an osteopathic student to match into IR or additional steps that you have to take, hoops that you have to jump. Um, so again, I think the key here is IR is a small community. Uh, get mentorship right away. Even if you are remotely thinking about it, get mentorship right away. Uh, if you don't have a home institution, seek out mentorship. Um, I was from South Jersey. I made connections both in Philly and North Jersey. Um, and that kind of just let me, um, give me, it gave me a better understanding of both how IR works, but then also how, um, like how, how, how it's so regionalized, right? So all, all, when I was in North Jersey, every, all the attendings knew everyone from New York. When I was in Philly, it was likewise, everyone in Philly and South Jersey knew each other. So do that first, get a social media account or Twitter account specifically, get on there. Um, it was awkward for me at first because I, I was never on, I was barely on Facebook and now uh, I had to tweet. And but it, honestly, it was looking back at it, it was nerve wracking, like, oh, should I retweet this? Or, you know, kind of like thinking about all the little things. But uh, at the end of the day, right now, I'm super happy about it because I meet a lot of people on Twitter. Uh, I learned so much, honestly, like so, some of the things that you just like people post about all the interesting cases. You're like, I wish I was there being a second assist for that case, you know? Um, so get a Twitter account, uh, be active, um, and then just general advice. I know it's nerve professional, nerve-wracking process. <laughs> yes, be professional. Do not take again. If you have a Twitter account from back when you were in college or high school, don't use that one. Just create a separate one. Um, don't post anything that's you know that could be that could be controversial. Um, but. Again, it's a nerve-wracking process. We're all here for you. Again, we've all are here and it's 9.30, all about to start intern year. Use us as a resource. Use upperclassmen uh, in your own school uh, and then reach out to mentors, okay? Um, specifically for Georgetown, uh, if you guys have any questions about the program, I know Lauren Park, uh, she was the previous chair. Uh, she was super involved in SIR. Uh, she's going to be starting her um, IR uh, or I guess her DR years as well. Um, she can answer those. I can answer as much as I can. I haven't started, but um, yeah, we're super friendly down here. Come to Georgetown. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Um, also for touching on the social media aspect, which we unfortunately had to skip. And maybe we can put out um, some sort of other written format guide because I know a lot of students have questions on how to kind of navigate the Twitter sphere specifically in terms of how to not be overbearing and such. So that's something we can definitely work on. Does anyone else have any other kind of advice about literally anything in this realm? Um, there's Just one generally, Sorry, go ahead. Please, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, just, uh, <laughs> um, you know, when you are, when you're going about the interview process, like, make sure you are okay with letting the colors of your personality show. So at the end of the day, it's, 
people choosing other people. Um, so, you know, like, I think it's really easy to get enraptured in the gravity of the process and, um, you know, how competitive the field is or whatever, but, you know, it's, it's really okay to let your guard down. And if you share a common interest with someone or they're trying to level with you, level with you about something, just, you know, uh, dive in and, and make a personal connection as well, even during an interview. So jumping Thank off you. of that, actually, personality-wise, um, I just want to address a question that I'm seeing here that um, from a while back, sorry, but it kind of speaks to me a little bit, something that I've been very interested in the field. What are some personalities associated with IR, especially compared to other procedural specialties, and the diversity in IR regarding background, education, race, LGBT+. Plus? So obviously, as a woman in IR, I'm apparently, what, like, one out of 12, it's maybe gotten a little bit better to like one out of eight in this group at this point. Um, I talked a little bit about being um, a woman in IR and why women in IR should consider it, but obviously there's so many other aspects in the intersectionality wise to diversity as well. And it's something that um, everyone in the world is learning and everyone has something to learn. Um, in regards to like the personalities associated with IR, I really just want to say that, I mean, it's cheesy, but there is a diversity. Like if we're going off Myers-Briggs, I've met quiet people, I've met louder people, I've met, you know, the people who are like work hard, party hard, I've met people who have that very um, white picket fence life, um, you know, it's, it, it's all sorts. But if there's one thing that brings us all together, um, at least from what I've seen, is it, it's inherently a very collaborative field. So I think that really translates really well to how we work together as a team. One of the things that I personally loved about um, the IR culture was seeing how like everyone on the team was really respected. Um, so, you know, as that med student, like working with the scrub techs and nurses, they really became like some of my very first mentors, right? And um, seeing um, attending level um, people um, acknowledging the what they bring to the team as well, which um, I'm not gonna sit, speak about you know stereotypes of other specialties but it's not something that i've seen in every interaction um, outside of ir let's put it that way um so obviously you know there's like um you know, there's all sorts in every field but ir because we do work with basically every service in the hospital um i think there is a level of like collaboration that is inherent to being a successful ir Thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you for also looking at the Slido questions and addressing one of them. That was, I'm, I'm really sorry also to our audience members that um, we were unable to answer all of them. I wish we had more time, um, as I'm sure everyone does. But I think this is where we have to end the panel on that note, which is a, a really great note. I think we got a lot of advice out. Um, and we have the contact information at the bottom. So I'm sure everyone on the panel is very welcome to be contacted by anyone in the audience. Um, as you can see, they're all very open people. Um, they're welcome to share all the experiences that they've had, and um, they'd love for you to reach out, so they definitely do. I also want to give special acknowledgments to Ryan Abood, who is the current chair of the MSC, who really helped me in terms of organizing this webinar, um, and hopefully we can get this webinar as an annual thing as it has been, as I'm sure it's, it's been a great resource for all students involved. Um, I also want to acknowledge Alana Breen, Sana Harewald and Wen Hu Zhu, who the slide deck has been based on in previous years. So with that, I'm gonna end the webinar. Thank you again to all our panelists for volunteering their valuable, valuable time during the transition process to a med school to intern year. Um, we really appreciate it and um, I'm looking forward to what you guys do next. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Varun. Great job. Great job. Thank you, Varun, for setting this up. Of course, of course. Um, Everyone for staying. staying <laughs> yes, thank you. This uh, is our IR party down. that we missed out on. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is Nashville. <laughs> Until Nashville, my friends. Yeah. <laughs> in Nashville. Also, SIR has great taste in um, convention places, so that's a bonus for IR too. <laughs> True. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.